And now I'd like to call to order the November 6, 2019 formal city council meeting. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilman DeCicio? Here. Councilmember Garcia? Here. Councilwoman Guardado? Here. Councilman Nowakowski? Councilwoman Pastor? Here. Councilwoman Stark? Here. Councilwoman Williams? Here. Vice Mayor Waring? Here. Mayor Gallego? Here. We have an interpreter with us here today. Mario, will you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Mayor. My name is Mario Warajas. I'm going to be uh, serving as today's Spanish interpreter. I'm going to be giving a brief announcement in Spanish. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Mario Warajas. Voy a estar sirviendo como su intérprete de español. Si acaso alguien necesitara el servicio de intérprete, podrán acudir hacia la parte de atrás de la sala para conseguir los aparatos para escuchar la interpretación hacia el español. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Will the clerk please read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6617, 6632 through 6639, S46119 through 46158, and resolutions 21769, 21792 through 21797. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor, have you had a chance to review the March 20th, 2019 formal meeting minutes? I have. I approve uh, the March 20th, 2019 min minutes. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? Councilman DeCicio, have you had a chance to review the April 3rd, 2019 formal meeting minutes? I move their approval, Mayor. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Both motions pass unanimously. Uh, Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on boards and commissions? Move to approve Mayor and City Council boards and commission nominations. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Congratulations to our citizens who have been nominated and approved for service. We have several residents here to be sworn in. I state your name, do solemnly swear, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution and laws of the State of Arizona, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic. and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the office of according to the best of my ability. So help me God. Congratulations and thank you for your service to your community. Congratulations to our new commissioners. Councilwoman Pastor, do you have a motion? I do. Mayor, I make a motion to suspend the rules and take item 108 out of order. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 108 is the selection of a new vice mayor. Mayor, uh, I have a nomination for the new vice mayor and that would be Councilwoman Betty Gerardo uh, to be selected as the new Vice Mayor. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Um, 
any, we'll, we'll do, uh, do we have any comments or discussion? I certainly want to thank Vice Mayor Waring f for his service as Vice Mayor of the City of Phoenix. I've been impressed with his knowledge of the city and his district and his noteworthy record of, of public service. So thank you for your service. Thank you, Mayor. And thanks for not pointing out we always disagree, but respectfully and enjoy each other's <laughs> company. So thank you. Wonderful. I'd like to thank Jim, too, for his service. I think he's done an exemplary job here as vice mayor, kept everybody on track. It was nice to see. Um, excited about Betty uh, Guardado becoming the next vice mayor. I think she's the fastest uh, vice mayor we've ever had, ever getting elected and then being vice mayor. Uh, it's impressive, but it also talks about her ability to get things done at the city of Phoenix. And so I would imagine you may have some of your family members here. Um, but they have got to be very proud of you and the fact that um, you've literally taken some major steps this first couple of years and you've been a leader up here on the council and enjoy serving with you. I mean, you're, you're doing an amazing job. Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? I want to thank um, Jim Waring. I think you're the longest standing vice mayor in the yeah. history of Phoenix. and. Um, Congratulations, uh, Betty. Yes. Pastor? Councilman Waring, you know, there are some votes that it's 9-0, so you do agree at certain times. Uh, I am a yes. Stark? I hope that Vice Mayor slash Councilman Waring gets to sit next to me <laughs> <laughs> in the reseating. Uh, thank you for all your service, uh, Vice Mayor. And a yes. Williams? Yes, and I'm going to thank uh, the Vice Mayor Waring. He did an excellent job for a long, long time. Uh, it took him a while to get going, evidently, uh, but uh, he has been a great leader for the city, so thank you, and yes. Waring? Gallego? Yes. By a vote of eight to one, congratulations to our next Vice Mayor, Betty Guardado. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so just say a couple of words. I am honored to serve as a vice mayor for the city of Phoenix, the fifth largest city in the country, right? We just gotta keep repeating that. I am so grateful for the support from my fellow council members and our mayor. I would also like to take a moment to thank Council Councilman Waring for his service to our city. Thank you so much, Jim, for everything that you have done. I know those are big shoes to fill. But, I, but I'm ready to work, work with all of my fellow council members to the best of my ability. I still have tons to learn. I still, I still have tons to see, but I'm very excited for this new role, very humbled for all the support that I've gotten um, with, with this appointment. Um, and with that, let's move forward. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you and congratulations. The <laughs> The vice mayor elect has already proven herself to be a strong advocate for all Phoenicians, and this is the most rapid ascent I have seen to vice mayor, so congratulations. At our next council meeting, she will assume the role of vice mayor. Uh, vice Mayor Waring, do we have a motion on liquor license applications? Uh, yes, Mayor. I move to approve items 4 through 26, um, except item 23, which is recommended for disapproval, and item 24, which is requested to be continued to December 4th, 2019, and item 26, which is requested to be continued. There was confusion in the ranks. So much for Sal's nice comment about the smooth running meeting, but all right. So try to pick up where we left off here. Um, and I, yeah, I'm a short timer, Michael. What can I say? Nervous, uh, nervous. And item, let me start over. Motion to approve, it's the same as we said before. Motion to approve item four through 26, except item 23, which is recommended for disapproval. Item 24, which is requested to be continued to December 4th, 2019. And item 26, which is requested to be continued to November 20th, 2019. And that item 25 is as corrected. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. 
Uh, we next move to item 23, which is a license in Councilwoman Pastor's district. Uh, we do have several cards on the item. Councilwoman Pastor, how would you like to proceed? I would like to hear about the the staff uh, disapproval, and then after that, proceed in listening to the cards. Wonderful. We'll begin with the staff presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Jenny Wingenroth with City Clerk, and with me today is Noelle Rascone from the Prosecutor's Office. Item 23 is a request for an ownership transfer of a Series 6 liquor license for a bar. This location was previously licensed for liquor sales and may currently operate with an interim permit. Staff recommends disapproval of this application based on a police department recommendation for disapproval. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, two cards marked in favor, one wishing to speak, and cards from our officers. Shall we hear from the officers first? Sure. All right, we have cards from Officer Vaughn and Officer Titus. I think Officer Vaughn. Yes. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego and members of the council. I'm Detective Vaughn with Phoenix Police Department. The Phoenix Police Department recommends denial for the Series 6 person-to-person -person transfer for the Caravan Tap Room located at 4835 North 15th Avenue. The applicant is Mr. Antonio Tovar through TT and Associates, LLC. On June 13, 2019, members of the Phoenix Police Department conducted a liquor inspection at the Caravan Tap Room. The only employee working at the time was the bartender, and he said Mr. Tovar was in charge. Two violations were found, one for failing to exhibit the liquor license and the other for employee records not being available. Warnings were given for both of these violations. On June 21st and June 22nd, 2019, the Arizona Department of Liquor License and Control cited Caravan Tap Room for ARS 4-244.32 allowing alcohol to be removed from the licensed premise. Mr. Tovar has acknowledged music, live entertainment, and patron dancing at the establishment, but, is not, but does not currently have a City of Phoenix use permit for these activities. Mr. Tovar was convicted of DUI in Phoenix in 2018. Mr. Tovar failed to designate a manager on the application as required by ARS 4-202.01c. On September 12th, 2019, an interview was completed with Mr. Tovar. Mr. Tovar said he was in the process of applying for the City of Phoenix use permit for live entertainment. As of October 22nd, he had not been granted that use permit. Mr. Tovar was unable to provide a copy of the lease, stating Mr. Keith Rowlands, the prior owner of Caravan Tap Room, and the property owner, Mr. Mohammed Patwari, refused to give him one. Mr. Tovar was explained his refusal to provide a lease agreement strongly suggests the possibility of hidden ownership. Mr. Tovar was explained by Phoenix investigators there would be likely reinspections of the bar during the investigation process. He understood and said there would be no issues and was cleaning up the place. Mr. Tovar denied being in charge of the bar on June 13, 2019. On October 5, 2019, Mr. Tovar submitted a request for more time for the application review. On October 11th, 2019, the Arizona Department of Liquor License and Control cited the caravan tap room for one count of violating ARS 4-241.A.1, failure to check ID, one count of violating ARS 4-244.9, sale of alcohol to underage, and one count of R, 19-1-502, failure to maintain employee records. In addition, an employee working at the time was criminally cited for two counts of violating ARS 3-2441.A1, failure to check ID, and two counts of violating ARS 4-244.9, sale of alcohol to underage. A few days after receiving these violations, Mr. Tovar finally provided the lease for the caravan tap room. Mr. Tovar has demonstrated he has little to no experience owning a bar and his lack of managerial oversight has demonstrated he is not reliable, capable, or qualified to own a liquor license. In addition, it would, be in the best in in it would not be in the best interest of the community to grant this approval. Thank you. Thank you. Haley Ritter is marked in favor. Are 
Are they here? I saw Haley outside, but I don't see. Um, and then uh, Mr. Tovar marked a card not to speak, but marked in favor. So I, th I think we are ready for a motion. Haley Ritter. Uh, yes, she is here. <laughs> Forgive me, I just, <laughs> I'm having a seizure right now. Please don't mind my electrical. Okay, I'm fine. Um, I, I've met Tony, uh, Mr. Tovar, uh, the owner, the current leasing person there. And I have a, a, a personal deaf friend of mine who's the first deaf bartender in the state of Arizona. He's very proud of himself. He's been working there for the past three months. And it's a very calm environment. There's not a lot of loud activity going on. And um, I recommend approval just because I know he's trying to clean up the place. He's trying to keep everything in line. He's, he's trying to learn the business of, of owning a bar and, and managing it. And I recommend that maybe the police department work with him and try and help him through some of the struggles that he's been having in establishing ownership. Um, he just seems like a very responsible person and, and I've met him personally. So I, I recommend approval of the liquor license, possibly once he gets through some of the challenges that he's been facing as far as the lease and the use permit and other details that were mentioned previously. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. So uh, yesterday I met with um, staff regarding the disapproval. Uh, after I met with staff, I called Mr. Tovar and left him a message asking him to call me back in order to speak with him and to discuss the case. Uh, I did not receive a call back um, and uh, wanted to uh, have a dialogue as to some of the the claims uh, that were part of the report, um, but uh, was giving the applicant an opportunity to speak with me. Um, at this moment, my motion is disapproval. We have a motion and a second, and for our staff, uh, do we need additional detail in the motion, or is? No, we're perfect. good, thank you. Any additional council member comments? Roll call. Decisio? Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nine zero. Passes 9 0. We next move to ordinances, resolution, new business planning, and zoning. City Clerk, are we ready for our next section? Yes, Mayor. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, I'm Mayor, I move to approve items 27 through 108, except the following. Items 39, 60, 63, 67, 68, 70, 86, 104, and 107. We have- We already did 108. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Decisio. It includes 104, correct, in the omnibus? It does not include it 104. Does, oh. We pulled out 104. Oh, because oh, you're holding that one out? Okay, well. I think somebody give a card, Denise. Oh, okay, well, yes then. D9. You're right. Um, I'm sorry, I left out 59. And I should have noted item 38 is being continued to November 20th, 2019. Thank you. You're Mrs. ready Steele? to go, right? Yeah. I'm ready for retirement. <laughs> Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Nine. Motion passes 9-0. Item 39, will the city clerk please read the title?
Item 39, Ordinance G6638, an ordinance amending and reorganizing Chapter 2, Article 2, Section 2, Just Dash 60 of the Phoenix City Code relating to the rules of council proceeding. Thank you. Do we have a do we have a motion? Mayor. Mayor. Councilwoman Pastor. Um, I have a can I have a friendly amendment on move approval? Sure can. Okay. I wanted to make a motion to approve item 39 as amended, uh, noting that rule 7C will go into effect on January 1st, 2021. Second. Uh, Agree. <laughs> We have a motion and a second. And, and Mayor? Councilman DeCicio. And I want to tell staff and, and your office too, thank you for working with us because we had a really good relationship on this case here. Uh, there's still some things in here that I've got problems with. Um, and those are dealing with eight and nine. It deals with First Amendment rights. And I think we've talked about that. I was just wondering if it, as a friendly motion, we'd be willing to put language in there that says that uh, that this is consistent with the First Amendment, protecting individual rights. And th the reason why is that I know uh, we may not like it when people yell at us and stuff. There's stuff in here that says that, you know, we can kick them out, but they shouldn't have to be able to petition their government. They shouldn't have to worry about going to court to, to protect their just their basic fundamental rights of calling us names. So. You know, I'm probably the target more than anybody <laughs> of being called a name or something, but I still think people have a right to do that. And they can use belligerent words, they can use bad words, they can say anything they want. They can't say, I'm gonna kill you because that's against the law. But outside of that, I mean, they really, and I just wanna make sure that we have some language in there that says, and I think it's, it's compromised language, at least from my end, but that says that uh, it has to be consistent with the First Amendment and individuals, an individual, individual's right to free speech on eight and nine as a friendly amendment. Could I have clarification on what you just said, Councilman? Is that included what we just set forth? No. Or is this an addition different? It would be additional language that says that primarily rule eight and rule nine, and there were other issues in there, but these were, these were the two big ones, or the, the, this was the big one. There were other things that I didn't feel that comfortable with, but I'm willing to work with, but um, just on eight and nine, it just, did, you know, whose definition of what is disrespectful, whose definition is of language, you know what I mean? That's more along the lines of where I'm at on that. I don't think we should have definitions on that, unless you want to have it very clear and precise, then we know what we're voting on. But I just, and again, I'm trying to move to get this thing approved, but at the same time, I'd sure like to make sure that we just, I don't, you know, have language in there as we protect an individual's right to free speech. And I, I think from my perspective, we would, we are only implementing things that are consistent with the Constitution. So that does not seem like a change that we need to make, but you made the motion. Yeah. May I add to that too? It's, you know, things that are already implied that might as well state it. You know, just for my end, I understand that we, we're not going to, but the only other alternative an individual has is then to take us to court for what could be a basic fundamental right, and then why should they go to court? I, it, I'm trying to be as, you know, just like to have language in there that says that, that gives the individual the rights, the individuals the right to call us names. And they have a right to be disrespectful to me and others. They have a right. It's whether I like it or not, I don't like it. But they have that right. Uh, uh, Councilman Williams. With, with all due respect, I think everybody has a right to say, but I also think that this is a public meeting. People come here for many reasons and I think a certain decorum is expected. Um, you can say a lot of things without having to swear, cuss, or really come out with some dirty names. And I think we're all very willing to listen, uh, but I do think that uh, for the respect of people in the audience as much as anybody, um, that it is necessary to let people know it's not appropriate. I, I agree. but. What is and what isn't appropriate shouldn't be done by us. I mean, I mean, 
at some point you got to you tell the public exactly what is and what isn't. I mean, you're basically saying here that they can't be disrespectful or repetitive. Well, sometimes they want to drill a point home. I know I repeat myself, you know, because I'm getting older, <laughs> you know, and I don't remember if I said it. So, I mean, there are times we're going to be repetitive on things. You know, it, I just, just don't feel comfortable with it. I'm just asking as a favor, but that's it. Thank you. Uh, Haley Ritter, followed by Dee Dee Barker. I know there's additional language, city council members and Mayor Gallego. I appreciate all of you. Um, there's a change in language that says something about limiting public comment to five minutes. And I, I wonder what that means, or I guess I'm just kind of curious about, I'd like some more clarification about this motion because um, it's a little confusing. I, as you all know me, I speak out on a lot of different issues. So I, the, I'd just like to know that my ability to make public comments won't be limited by this motion, kind of in echoing what Mr. DeCicio was saying. Um, so uh, I'd just like to know whether or not this is going to be limiting public comment to five minutes or, or if it's only regarding public disruption and disruptive language. A little confused, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, the goal is to codify what the city has been doing and encourage people to comment on the agenda item being heard. Uh, Dee Dee Barker will be followed by Michelle Rose. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. I'm Diane Dee Dee Barker, and I've been coming down to City Council since the 80s. But don't tell anybody, because I still do cartwheels. But, um, you know, I am very much for local government and preserving democracy. And since I've been coming to uh, local government, the city of Phoenix, I have seen great breath in allowing the public to speak. So I'm hoping that, with Mayor Kate, we'll continue in that honor and we will be reasonable and always remembering the Constitution. And I know that we have our city mayor here, uh, city attorney here to ask questions of. And I would imagine if a person is despondent, you'll hear from them. You may hear from them through a legal cause. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle will be followed by Wade Paget. Hi, my name is Michelle Rose. Thank you for letting me speak. I am speaking in opposition to Rule 9 as it's written. Uh, I would support it with revisions. I understand there is a need for some degree of civility. I don't think people should be cursing at you, attacking you, uh, no interrupting people. However, allowing the mayor to select who gets to speak and for how long is an attack on in my opinion, an attack on free speech and right to petition your government. I realize by the letter of the law it may not be, but it exposes the city unnecessarily to allegations of selective application of that law, of that code. Uh, the city council's human beings, uh, unconscious biases will come into play. And for those who uh, are wishing to give the mayor authority, I would say be wary that these rules continue. You may support Mayor Kate Gallego and think she has great uh, fairness and civility, but she won't be the mayor forever. You may not like the next person and how they apply it. So instead, I would suggest um, having something like the request to speak system that the state offers so that uh, in a city of 1.6 million residents, you are going to run long. So that way everyone has an opportunity to at least have their voice recorded um, online. I will mention regarding having Phoenix residents have priority. That makes sense. This is the city of Phoenix, but this is a big city now. 
people who live in Mesa work in Phoenix. People who live in Gilbert come into Phoenix um, to go to concerts and such. Uh, also, opposition to Rule 11 with the 30-minute limit until this is in place. Thank you. Thank you. Wade will be followed by Leslie Pico. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am speaking today in opposition to Rule 9, uh, not least of which has to do with all of the ideas presented up to this point, but that as of 1962, when the Arizona Open Meetings Law was established, uh, passed by the Arizona legislature, the mayor had exactly the rights uh, under discussion uh, that are being spoken about. My problem with the institution of Rule 9 has more to do with its being unnecessarily provocative. It will serve to provoke, as well as drive people away from this participatory system. Uh, there will be a wide range, depending on the issues, of reactions from the people in the community. And I think it's important to bear that in mind. In fact, state law actually does require that the context be borne in mind before somebody is restricted in terms of time or ordered to be removed. I think that's basically it. I am in opposition to Rule 9. Thank you. Leslie will be followed by Sean Severed. Hi. I am uh, deeply concerned about public comment restrictions that clearly suppress a citizen's ability to speak to their elected officials on matters of public concern, in particular during the very public meetings where officials are weighing those issues. I'm asking the council to stop acting like public comment is something to be endured. A public body that represents the fifth largest city in the United States can make time to let the people speak and be heard, no matter how offensive you may find it. I stand in opposition to this item. Thank you. Sean will be followed by Chimene Hawes. Mayor uh, and members of council, um, I just want to say, you know, I think since Mayor Gallego has come into office, she's uh, executed a very efficient council. And in many ways, that's, that's a good thing. Um, and in other ways, it's not, right? So it's not up to you to just deal with the public as a nuisance. If you want efficiency, you're probably not in the right line of business. You might want to get into private industry. Um, public service is what this is about. You are public servants, um, or at least you should be. So, you know, when Mayor Gallego came into office, um, some of the things that she did already when it comes to the public interacting with the council um, was that she has taken the ability for the council to uh, address citizen petitions and put it to a subcommittee. Uh, she moved the citizen comments to the, from the beginning to the end of the meeting. So all of these things are great if you want an efficient meeting run well, and I get that. Um, but it's, it's extremely disturbing, and I don't think a lot of people know what this even is because Mayor Gallego's office quietly drafted it. Um, without a lot of people knowing. And what it essentially does is it allows the, the council, the presiding officer or the mayor, whoever is presiding over the council meeting at the time to essentially eliminate whoever's speaking time. Um, so that's a, a grave concern, obviously. Um, I don't care if I fundamentally disagree with whatever somebody is saying, they have a right to come here, especially if they took off of work to be here um, to address the council 
the council shouldn't have the ability to cut them off. Um, and so I, I would think long and hard before uh, you approve this. Thank you. I'm Shemin Haas. Thank you for putting up with my slow moving around here. I'm having horrible back spasms, but there's no way I was going to stay home while you guys are doing this. Because I sometimes feel like you make these changes just to talk to me. Because I was the person that came up here, Kate, and said you were acting like a last time I got on this microphone. And Sal, I told you to sit down and get used to the sound of my voice because I was coming for you. So. I can't help but wonder if this isn't some sort of retaliatory measure to try to get me to sit down and shut up, which I'm not going to do, and I'm never going to do. And I might want to remind you that well-behaved women rarely make history, and I have no intention of going through this life unnoticed. Also, you might hear that um, a riot, a riot is the response to an unheard crowd. And <laughs> the last time we got unheard, came down here to talk to Chief Jerry about it. She doubled down and decided to deal with us with LRAD devices, which you promptly approved in the budget. So to say that you guys are sending the wrong message to the people that you're supposed to be representing is putting it a little mildly. And I think you need to get together and remember who you work for. You're elected officials, you answer to us. You cannot answer to us if you never listen to us. We are the ones that are closest to the problem. We are the ones that have the solutions if you will only listen to us. Listen to us. Don't try to shut us up anymore. Don't put any more rules on it. It's bad enough that we only get two minutes of your valuable time. When Sal gets to go and you know take vacations and call it in from his car whenever he feels like it. That's not the way this is supposed to work, people. Not the way this is supposed to work. You're supposed to be getting paid to work for me, so I don't have to take time off work and come down here and tell you how things need to be done. Does that make sense? You cannot limit public comment. We already know how to behave, and we will behave the way we want. And if you don't want us to burn this place down, forget this option. That is all the cards we have on this item. Council member comments? Council member Garcia. Yeah, Mayor, um, I think we should be doing things to encourage more public participation, maybe moving meetings to the evenings, provide parking, and encourage more participation. So I will be voting no on this. Councilwoman Pastor. Um, it was very interesting because I've been, uh, you know, not interesting, but I've been in the community and some of the community comments that have been happening just recently, especially with the young youth, uh, have been around public comment and really the fact that they don't feel like they're being heard. And when coming to uh, the public comment uh, space, that it becomes, they become really discouraged to participate uh, in the sense of uh, us not being able to respond, uh, but also not, us not able to then follow up. We, some of us follow up, uh, but they're now saying they're being, they're now becoming disengaged because of our process and how we uh, place, um, I don't wanna use, uh, how we just limit what is happening in the public comment arena. Um, and so I do understand uh, the fact that uh, when the public comes to up to us and they're very upset that uh, there are inappropriate words or inappropriate behavior at that moment happening in the sense of uh, just uh, pure frustration. And uh, sometimes we have to take that energy and sometimes we have to just sit uh, gracefully and understand what is happening. And so I, I understand uh, some of the pieces and I understand uh, why we're trying to clean up uh, some of our, our rules and proceedings, but um, I'm just expressing what, what has been told to me. Um, Tony, I have a question. On rule eight, um, it says citizen comments. 
But then it gets crossed out and it says debate and decorum and elected officials. Where did that get moved? Yes, Mayor and Council Members and Councilwoman Pastor, we made, when we uh, included the new section on debate and decorum, um, Rule 9, it shifted around the numbers. So, so citizen comment is still there. It's rule number 11. Okay. It has not changed at all. So citizen comment is still at the end of the meeting for up to 30 minutes, provided that there's a quorum of the council. That rule has not changed at all. It okay, just so moved, it just got its shifted. number moved. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any additional comments? Roll call. Decisio? No. Garcia? No. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Passes 6-3. Next item is item 59. Item 59 is a public hearing and resolution to approve 2020 Downtown Enhanced Municipal Services District assessments. We will open the public hearing. Uh, we have a large number of stakeholders here uh, in support of the item, marking cards wishing not to speak. Uh, we have no cards wishing to speak, so noting a wide variety of stakeholders supporting the item will close the public hearing. Any council members wishing to provide comments? Roll call. Oh, I'm sorry, we need a motion. Move approval. Second. <laughs> 59, correct? Yep, we have a motion and a second. Yes. Roll call. Decisio? No. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Item passes seven to two. Item 60? Approve approval. Second. Any council member comments or questions? Roll call. Decisio? No. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Gallego. Yes. Seven, two. Item passes to 7-2, an exciting time for our downtown. Item 63. Mayor? Councilwoman Williams. Um, this is the Mexico trade development, I believe. It is. I, I truly support this because uh, last spring, uh, Councilwoman Pastor and I were invited to go to Aramisio, uh, where uh, at that time they were running our Mexico office there. And uh, I'll tell you, I had a few questions and doubts. I didn't, first time I'd been there, ever been involved, but I was very, very impressed. They had a training se session with uh, Christy Mackey and they were hoping to get 75 people come. And the object was to uh, invite them to come set up a business in Phoenix, be part of our world as we were down there talking to them. We had over 300 show up, standing room only. And they were very gracious. They were very, very impressed with how the office ran. And I think it was a real asset. What concerns me now is we've kind of got caught up in politics, I think. And I'm very worried that Mexico, Hermosillo, doesn't understand what's going on here and the fact that they think we've abandoned them, that we're not providing the same type of service, that we're breaking a connection that was not only with the city of Phoenix but with the state. And I think it's a real loss to this community uh, for us to break that type of situation or partnership. So I would move to approve this. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, we have 
Five cards marked in favor. Uh, Carmen Ronan. Carmen will be followed by Glenn Hammer. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego and Phoenix City Council members. I'm Carmen Ronan, and I'm manager of International Trade Services for Malera Alvarez. I'm here to answer any questions you may have and emphasize the merits of the proposal we submitted to provide Mexico trade development services. I'd also like to recap what our team, in conjunction with city staff, has been able to achieve as your trade representatives in Mexico for the last five years. We have helped more than 140 Phoenix companies explore business opportunities in Mexico, conducted 31 trade missions, represented Phoenix at 82 trade shows and conferences, negotiated six bilateral cooperation agreements, and much more, all of which help increase two-way trade. Our mission is to grow the number of jobs here in Phoenix and give Phoenix companies a stronger competitive advantage as they trade with Mexico. And we have the experience and capabilities to do this. In the negative aftermath of SB 1070, Phoenix's reputation in Mexico suffered. Through this contract, we repaired this critical relationship with Arizona's largest trading partner, and now Mexico has opened its doors to Phoenix. Phoenix can continue to demonstrate how much it values its relationship with Mexico and expand this foundation of trust and deep relationships that have formed. We recommend the city support our collective effort to bring in more jobs and enhance trade opportunities with our valued neighbor. We've been proud to be your liaisons and hope to continue this important work. We're also honored to have the support of various government and business leaders and would like to submit uh, letters of support on their behalf to the council. Thank you. And uh, an uh, Glenn Hammer will have an additional two minutes of, of donated time, so four minutes. Um, Glenn will be followed by Fabian Valenzuela. Mayor Gallego, members of the City Council, my name is Glenn Hammer, President and CEO of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, for over the last year, the, the Arizona Chamber has been the leader in Arizona working with the business community to get the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, USMCA, uh, over the line. This, this agreement uh, connects 230,000 jobs across the state of Arizona, the bulk of which are in the city of Phoenix. Uh, critically important, as we're probably on the eve of a bipartisan movement to get this agreement over the line, is for the city of Phoenix, Arizona's largest city, the fifth largest city uh, in, the, in the United States, to take full advantage. And I think it's very important to understand that when this office was established five years ago, uh, as, as some others have alluded to, uh, it was not the greatest uh, situation in terms of the state of Arizona or the city of Phoenix. And w this is the time to double down. The team of Malara, Malara Alvarez has done a brilliant job working with uh, the leaders in the business community, the, the largest, uh, certainly the largest business groups, as well as small and medium-sized enterprises to really make this a valuable uh, exercise. And what are the results? Far and away, Mexico is Arizona's largest trading partner. Uh, far and away, it's Phoenix's largest export market. It's an extraordinarily important source of jobs across the board, whether it's semiconductors or tourism or manufacturers. In fact, this shortest flight to another nation's capital is to the city of Mexico City from Phoenix. It's two hours, 50 minutes. It's less than an hour to Hermosillo. In large part because of this collective activity, we now have a, a second American Airlines flight going into Hermosillo. For the life of me, it doesn't, this is not the time to, to go backwards. And that's why you have groups like the Arizona Chamber, Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, Arizona Technology Council, uh, the Black Chamber, the Arizona Hispanic Chamber, the Arizona Lodging and Tourism Association saying we really need to go forward. And I just want to commend uh, former Mayor Greg Stanton. He, he traveled to Mexico 18 times during the darkest, uh, some of the darkest 
times in terms of the relationship with Arizona and Mexico. And I will say that he almost single-handedly helped mend it and created an environment that many of you have helped participate in to build it up. And this chamber has strongly supported the trade office on the state level from the Arizona Commerce Authority, and we have strongly supported the trade offices uh, from the city of Phoenix. We need to be doubling down with our friend, ally, and neighbor, Mexico. This is not the time to retreat. And I want to thank uh, the Malara Alvarez team for being, uh, for, for really leading the charge and creating uh, so much value. And my final point, so look, they won this contract fair and square. We know that there was, uh, that there was a challenge. Uh, they won on points big time. Uh, I'll say on behalf of the mainstream business community in the state of Arizona, uh, they've produced results. And if this continues, I would expect that the city of Phoenix will see more flights, more jobs, more tourism, a lot more good things with our friend, neighbor, and ally, Mexico. And I'll close with, uh, you know, I thought uh, Mayor Williams' comments were right in, 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 in many respects. Uh, that Hermosillo trip was a great trip. Uh, we, I don't know how we would explain to our friends in Hermosillo, in Mexico City, in Mexico, that at the eve of USMCA, with all of this forward momentum, that uh, the fifth largest city in the United States of America is uh, saying adios. It's the wrong message, and uh, I, I would urge uh, the city council uh, respectfully uh, to keep the offices open. Thank you. Thank you. Fabian will be followed by Mike Huckins. Hi, everybody. I'm Fabian Valenzuela, and I represent Label and Printing Solutions. Uh, we are uh, benefited from these um, services, from their help. Uh, in 2006, the Hermosillo office approached to us to invite us to open a manufacturing company here in Phoenix. They help us. Uh, we are very thankful for that. They help us to locate for a great location close to the airport. They help us to the lease contract, which can be very complex, so many pages. They help us to give us the certificate of occupancy to apply. They refer us to a company uh, who give us all the drawings and to get the permits. And it's a great help. Uh, we end up investing 2.4 million in just in printing equipment. Uh, we make packaging and 150,000 invest in just um, for installations. Uh, we have a five year contract, which is a half a million dollars just in, in rent office. We have created um, 17 um, employees um, hire. And we have uh, so far um, a cap get uh, two and three, three, three major um, customers that have increased our sales significantly. So I thank you for that, and I think that uh, they are. Sonora is uh, um, close to the border, um, but they are bigger market, bigger city that this can be extended to another cities and states, and you will see a great benefits. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Mike Huckins, Vice President of Public Affairs for the Greater Phoenix Chamber. Uh, thank you for having me here today and allow me to say a few words on behalf of the trade, Mex the trade offices in Mexico. Uh, we are here in support of staff recommendation uh, on this item. Uh, since, as Glenn mentioned, so the City of Phoenix opened the trade offices in Mexico in 2014, the offices have put Phoenix on the map in ways that we never were before. The trade offices provide Phoenix and Phoenix business owners with exposure and resources, resources in one of the world's largest markets. The trade offices are an essential valuable, and valuable resource for Arizona's small and medium-sized businesses and their business owners. The partnership has provided them with the resources they need to break into a for foreign market such as Mexico and be successful. Phoenix and Arizona have worked for several years to build and improve relations with Mexico, something that Glenn um, uh, hammered home. Mexico is our largest partner, and it's vital to our state's economic potential that the trade offices get back up and running as soon as possible. Given the pending ratification of the USMCA at the federal level, it is critical that Arizona, and especially Phoenix, lead the way in showing trade support however possible. Uh, small and medium businesses uh, selling exports to one of our largest trade partners is a great asset to our economy. Uh, 
Uh, for the good of the city, the region, and state relationships with Mexico, uh, we urge the, respectfully urge the council to approve this item and get the trade offices back up and running as soon as possible. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That is all of our cards from the uh, public. Council member comments. I would, um, Mayor, I would Best like door. to uh, ask Chris Mackey uh, several questions. So the item that is in front of us, uh, item number 63, uh, this was through an RFP, and in the process of the RFP, uh, Malora, Malera Alvarez uh, received the highest points. Mayor Councilwoman Pastor, that is correct. Could you tell me the process of the RFP and how we all had input on, uh, on the pieces of the RFP and how it went through subcommittee? Mayor Councilman Pastor, uh, you're correct. In uh, if we go back just a little bit, 2014, the council first authorized a, a contract for Mexico office. That Mexico office had a five-year life, which ended uh, in on June 31st, uh, July 31st of 2019. In preparation for that uh, completion of the contract, staff came to council a subcommittee in March of 2019 asking for authorization to issue an RFP. A council had some input at the subcommittee level as to what the RFP, how it should be crafted in looking at foreign direct investment, focusing more on business to business, and looking at the expansion opportunities within Mexico, keeping Mexico City and Hermosillo offices, but looking at other cities in which to do business that we, uh, to locate of which to do business. Staff modified the RFP and issued it in March of 2019. We had five proposers, two of which were non-responsive. In uh, May of 2019, the panel did, uh, a, an independent panel did uh, sit and interview the three proposers and they recommended Malera Alvarez to move forward. And they recommended it, I'm reading, June 10th, 2019. Mayor Councilman Pastor, that is correct. And then on June 17, 2019, uh, the city received a protest. Can you talk about the protest process and what happened in the protest process? Yes, Councilman Pastor, if I might, I'll turn it over to our procurement officer, Gretchen Wolf, who worked through that uh, protest process. Gretchen? Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor. So yes, we actually received two protests for the uh, award recommendation. One was from a proposer that didn't have legal standing. Its proposal had actually been disqualified earlier in the process. The second protest that we received was from an unsuccessful proposer. Uh, so they questioned how we scored the fees uh, and raised some other issues. Uh, we, they protested in a timely manner. We reviewed their protest. We did not find a legal basis to overturn the panel's recommendation. We sent them that notice. Um, per the code, they are allowed to appeal that decision. We did receive that appeal. We forwarded it to the state's Office of Administrative Hearings. They reviewed it, and they made a recommendation to us to dismiss that appeal. Uh, we sent them that notice as it was the end of the administrative options for them to challenge this award recommendation, and we're here with you today. Okay, so then there's two processes if uh, the first process, uh, they're able to, if they don't like the answer, then there's a second process. That's true. I kind of look at it as you're going through the courts and then you go to the Supreme Court and the final judgment is there. That's, that's how I'm relating it. Okay. That's correct. My other question is that, um, is how long has the Mexico Trade Office been closed? Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, the existing contract, uh, the last day of that contract was July 31st, and so there was no contract uh, on August 1st to keep our Hermosillo office or our Mexico City office open. So they've been closed since that time. So August, September, October, so about three months? That's correct. Okay. Um, I'm just... I'm just a little bit taken back by, by this whole process uh, in the sense of the, everybody has a right to appeal 
and uh, get to the appeal. And, and we are here today because the appeal demonstrated that uh, what happened in the RFP was valid and that uh, the, the group that was selected is, is, is a group that was selected. Um, if this does not pass, what, is, what are the next steps? Because this, this RFP or they're not selected, then what are the next steps and how long are the next steps in order to open up an office in Mexico? Mayor, um, Councilwoman Pastor, at this time we have authorization from the council to complete this RFP. Staff would have to uh, come up with a new strategy to come forward for council's consideration on how we might uh, continue to conduct business in Mexico. Council could also give us direction on how they'd like us to conduct business in Mexico. So how long that would take if it's a new RFP, um, you know, plus or minus six months as we work through a new request for proposal process. If it's a different direction from council, we would implement it as, as quickly as we could. <coughs> Could we do it internally? I mean, could we manage this contract internally? Um, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, with our, uh, we have since July 31st, we've been doing our best to manage what activity we can in the Mexico market. We would most likely have to look for additional resources from the, from the council to be able to manage a contract to the level at which we've been able to execute our Mexico offices. We've found it very beneficial to have boots on the ground, if you will, in Mexico where people can visit our offices and work directly. So we would need a, a bit more robust of a staff to be able to execute that efficiently. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Garcia. Can you explain a little bit more what that would look like, what it would take for, I'm assuming it would be under your office, what, it, what kind of staffing or what it would take to do something like that? Mayor Councilman Garcia, um, I could kind of give you a general idea now. A staff, we would need to sit down with staff and really work on what a strategy would look like. But if you look at the contract we have today and the, the resources that we have at our disposal today, if we were to try to replicate similar activity, we would need a trade representative in Mexico City. We'd need a trade representative in Hermosillo. We would need an individual or two individuals with the city to be able to conduct that business and be able to guide that business from this location. So, um, you know, certainly two or three uh, additional staff members, and we'd need some time to write how that strategy would, would look like working with the council and gain your input on what you would like us to execute. Uh, how long would this uh, current RFP put us, like how long would this contract be? Mayor Councilman Garcia, the contract as uh, we had proposed to move forward, it is a two-year contract, and then it does have three one-year renewals for the council's consideration each year. So this would, the contract, should council choose to approve it, would be in place for 20 and 21. We'd be back at council uh, looking for authorization for an extension in 22, should that be something that you give us direction. Councilman Nowakowski. So, oh, Mayor, I was actually one of the individuals that advocated this from the very beginning. It was back with um, Phil Gordon, then um, Greg Stanton, and then, um, matter of fact, it was um, Sal DeCicio that connected us with Tom Faris to really work together with the state uh, so we can actually have a joint office in Mexico City. So, I believe that we've done a great job, and more and more that people hear about our our good works in Mexico, we're starting to hear from different consulates. Um, I actually serve as an honorary chair on the consulate, um, the, the core consulates, and they're always saying, well, why can't we have one? Why can't we have one in England? Why can't we have one with all of our sister cities? And you all have to think outside of the box, and let's, let's think global instead of just Mexico. And I think it's a good idea. I think it's an opportunity for us to really sit down, say time out, and really look at a global way of, of attracting business here in the city of Phoenix. I mean, we have one-way um, 
direct air flights to different countries now, which makes it very easy for us to have trade between those, um, those countries. And we have our sister cities program with, and how can we use our sister cities, how can we use economic development office. Um, since the office has been closed, I had several meetings with uh, Juan Batrias and individuals that are interested to come to um, Phoenix. And, and matter of fact, um, the mayor and the, the um, general consulate of, um, of the United States that's stationed in Admiral Seal um, gave us a call when there was a problem in Admiral Seal to see if we can ex exist them with some expertise from our firefighters. So myself and, um, and our future vice mayor were able to fly down there and help them out. And those are the types of relationships that we should have throughout the whole world, not just with with Mexico, so I like to really look at a way to, if we're gonna spend more than a half a million dollars, um, that we look at how to make it more global, how, why we're not in Central America also, um, you know? So if, if that's, that's my recommendation, that's what i like to see in the near future, Mayor, maybe um, you, can, um, you can set us off to look at a more global look, and at the same time, um, how do we continue those partnerships? I know that your staff is working really good with some nonprofits here, like Chicanos por la Causa, to find some revenues and, and small business loans for individuals like what we just heard right here, that it was all possible because of um, a small business loan that we were able to team people up together. And I think our staff's doing a wonderful job, and, and the businesses are continuing. Um, we're not there physically, but I think we can um, we can actually come up with uh, thinking outside the box and, and doing it the Phoenix, you know, Team Phoenix approach. So with that, Mayor, I think um, I'd like to maybe not call it, I call it sort of like a timeout and just re really rethink this whole um, um, trade, um, not just trade to Mexico, but trade throughout the whole global world. Thank you, Councilman, and thank you for your leadership on Mexico issues both through the Sister City program and through other venues. Uh, you've been recognized by the country of Mexico for your commitment to that relationship. Councilwoman Pestor. I actually think that's a really good idea. I just don't think that uh, we should hold up the Mexico Trade Office. I think that we look at a, a global plan um, in the sense that uh, Mexico is here, and then we like look at Central America, and we look at Canada, and we look at all the different areas and, and be able then to have uh, many uh, different RFPs uh, globally reaching the different markets that we need to reach. Uh, I think one of the, the ideas should be which markets are we going to hit? We know that we've are been successful and are doing or was doing great success uh, with uh, the Mexico trade. Uh, one of the experiences that I had, I was fortunate to go on three trade missions, but one of the last experiences with Councilwoman uh, Williams was definitely that uh, exposure to seeing how 300 people were waiting in line and staff. Uh, we went on to another event and uh, the mayor was hosting us of Hermosillo and she, she was saying, I have never seen something like this. And the trade that came out of that, uh, because staff didn't arrive until I believe 10, 10.30, uh, what ended up happening once you know we, we do our thing and then we come back, what ended up happening is several months later, uh, I get invited to uh, Hermosillo's woman's business uh, summit and I walk in and I'm just like okay well, I'm gonna go I end up meeting over 50 women that are wanting to come and see how they begin to trade back and forth and begin to what is the process uh, to me that's very impressive specifically the fact that the women are uh, uh, not that they haven't but they're now really engaged on wanting to do that uh, I would hate to lose the momentum um, and uh, I would hate for politics get, to get in the middle of all of this, but it's up to the council. Thank you. Councilwoman Williams. I, I think uh, Councilman has a very good idea. What I like to, because I hate the interruption down there, um, I think it reflects badly on us and we lose momentum. I'd like to see us go with the two years 
uh, while we develop a global plan and decide if we want to expand offices in other areas, but it would keep us alive and going in Hermosillo and in Mexico City. Just my suggestion. Motion? I made a motion to approve, to. Okay, uh, yeah, can I amend my motion? For, yes. Uh, to approve this for two years? Yeah, so my understanding is a year instead of the two years? Well, I think that you said the contract is for two years and then three one-year renewals. Right. Yeah, uh, I would think correct. It will, I know government moves slowly. We like to think we're pretty speedy, but we're not. Uh, and I think by the time you get the input from the community, from the council members, uh, from your staff, developing a plan to go forward to maybe do multiple offices in different countries, that could be 18 months down the road. I don't want to see Aramoseo empty for another 18 months. I think that it ruins our reputation. Uh, it, it, it's just not good business for Phoenix or Arizona. And I really think if we could keep it open and flowing for two years, it gives you ample time to come up with something new. And if not, it can be brought back for reconsideration. Yeah. Okay, I understand it now. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. So both the motion maker and the seconder, it would be a, a, a two-year contract mm -hmm. is the motion. Uh, any additional comments before we vote? Roll call. DeCicio? A mere explanation of vote. Um, it's a difficult decision for me. I've been consistent voting against lobbying contracts and I'm gonna be voting no today, but it's not a reflection on the firm at all. I think uh, it's an amazing firm that's there. But, you know, it, and it's hard because Michael and I did approach Greg at the time, the mayor, and got this thing started. And this has evolved and changed a lot from the first time. We, we had multiple partners, and it wasn't Phoenix going at it alone. Uh, we had the state. We had others involved in it. Um, and so it is a difficult thing, and Mayor, your leadership on Mexico is just, you know, I mean, you're, you should have been mentioned today. You weren't, but you, they should have because of the amount of work that you've done uh, making sure that we restore our ties to Mexico. Uh, it is our largest trading partner, without a doubt. They are, you know, they're an amazing partner. They've been a great partner for us, and they work with us in, in a lot of ways. But I'm not going to be able to vote today on this, Mayor, vote yes on this. Um, um, just not going to be able to get there. Thank you. Garcia? Explain my vote. No, that, that's a no. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Sorry. Um, as someone born in, in Mexico and Sonora, I, I care deeply about this, this commitment. Um, a lot of this politics that keeps getting mentioned happened before um, I got here, so I, I think I would welcome a, a fresh start. Um, in my view, I think as a city, we should invest in, in our department. Um, I wish we would have had more time to kind of figure it out, whether it's a one year, two year, but with kind of an agreement that we're developing our own folks internally as it's going on. Um, and so I, I'm committed to continuing this process, the relationship with Mexico, whatever uh, our office could do to, to make that happen. Uh, but unfortunately, today I'm gonna vote no. Guardado. So just wanted to explain my vote as well. I, I went to the trip with Councilman Nowakowski, saw the need in Hermosillo, saw what's, what's happening there. I'm very excited about the partnerships. I'm coming from, from a Mexican family. I get it, I understand. Um, I'm very excited you know, to see um, what, is, what is it more that we can do as a city. And then also now as a council member, like definitely um, excited to figure out how, as a, how our office can be more helpful and be more hands-on. Um, again, like I love the partnerships. I love our sister cities program. And hope, moving forward, hopefully we'll be able to get a fresh start. So I'll be voting now. Nowakowski? No. Pastor? I'm actually gonna vote yes. And the reason why I'm voting yes is because of the process. Um, 
I think when politicians get in the middle of procurement and start dictating um, or quietly or have people uh, call uh, and dictate uh, why they should vote no on um, a process, for me, it's about the purity of the process. I don't care who gets this RFP. It's not about that. It's about the fact that there is a due process of when you do not receive a proposal and, there, and you can go through it, and then there's findings and demonstrating that the staff uh, did everything correctly in the process in awarding a proposal. So I'm a yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? I am definitely a yes. I think this is what's best for the city to keep this open and going and then continue on. Waring? No. Gallego? No. It, uh, motion fails three to six. Or six to three, I guess. Six to three. Three to item 67. Uh, I would move item 67. Okay. We have multiple transportation items. Okay. Um, City Clerk, do we have any cards on item 67? No, Mayor. Um, could we take 67, 68, and... Well, we'll just, okay, we'll just, we have a motion on, on 67. Okay. And, and a second. second. Any comments? Roll call. Decisio? Garcia? Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Castor? Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Item passes 7 to 1. Move 68 for approval. Second. Motion is second. Any comments on 68? Any cards? Roll call. Decisio? 68, correct? Mm -hmm. No. Garcia? Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Castor? Yes. Stark? Williams? Yes. Waring? No. Gallego? Yes. Item passes 6 to 2. Item 70 related to pedestrian safety improvements, Haley Ritter. And while she is coming forward, would entertain a, a motion. Move to approve item seven. Motion to approve. Second. Pedestrian safety mm -hmm. is a very important part of my life as I travel by bicycle everywhere. I'm a little disappointed in the lack of bicycle studies done in things like pedestrian safety. There's a lot of, um, excuse me, I'm a little short here. Um, there's a lot of pedestrians at the 19th Avenue and Camelback area. I'm not 100% familiar with exactly what's on this item, but I just want to I want to thank you all for your support in improving pedestrian safety. It's a big it's a big issue here in the in the valley, and I see people on bicycles everywhere I go. I think streets are a little bit street um, car lanes are too wide they don't need to be 12 feet they can we can get away with having 10 foot wide car lanes and um, and still have flowable traffic for motorized vehicles while also having bicycle lanes on most and hopefully at some point all major arterial roads um, I feel like I'm kind of caught between being a pedestrian and being uh, a driver or something because I ride a bicycle everywhere and it's it's very important that cars respect speed limits and there's a lot of drivers who would completely ignore stoplights and turn around corners without stopping I see that kind of activity all the time and that that concerns me um, some of these streets that are that are actually on the ticket for for getting improvements with lighting and and hawk signals and i want to thank the city on all those improvements because they're doing a great job with that 
Um, but as far as the widening of, or as far as the streets that are like Indian School between 19th Avenue and 7th Avenue where there's no bicycle lane, I think that that area could be slimmed down with more narrow car lanes to fit a bicycle. The city needs to work, the city staff members need to work a little bit harder and I encourage the city council to encourage them to do so in order to improve pedestrian safety. Thank you. Thank you. This year's budget prioritized pedestrian safety with additional infrastructure funds. So this item will let us move forward with a variety of upgrades, including better street lighting. Any council member comments? Roll call. Decisio? Uh, yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Nowakowski? Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. 8-0. Item 86. Uh, Mayor, so this item got pulled because the wrong box got checked. The card was supposed to be, if necessary, to speak. So Alan has a presentation ready, but I'm happy to make the motion, and we can just vote if that's uh, okay with Alan. Mayor, Vice Mayor, I'm very happy with that. Mayor? Excellent. This Your is brother. an exciting item. We are hearing from many people in Desert Ridge about things they'd like to see and now moving forward with it. So congratulations to District 2. Move to approve item 86. Second. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Decisio? Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. 9-0. Item 104. Item 104 is a case in Councilwoman Pastor's district. We have uh, two cards marked in favor and uh, one in opposition. Sh uh, shall we take a motion or would you like to hear the cards first? I would like to hear the cards and then. Uh, perfect. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave Jenkins is marked opposed. <coughs> Hi, I'm Dave Jenkins. I'm a proud long-term Carnation neighborhood resident. I'm following this project closely. I've had one-on-one -on -one talks with neighborhood activists and the developer. I'm not going anywhere as Carnation is my home. I'm asking for the developer and the city of Phoenix to honor Carnation's family-oriented history, to preserve the neighborhood and to provide a physical traffic diversion on the property's Third Avenue access. Our concern is real. We need more than a sign. Without a diversion, my friends and neighbors will be at risk for a, fatal for a fatal tragedy. I don't want to see that happen, and I'm sure you wouldn't either. This property could honestly create over a thousand car trips through the neighborhood daily. Walkers, joggers, bikers, and family with young kids on a family bike ride will be at risk. Please don't allow outside traffic through our neighborhood. Drivers wanting to avoid the heavy travel Indian School Road will drive into the neighborhood. Our neighborhood is not designed for outside traffic. I've seen other neighbors, neighborhoods and designed a traffic diversion that works. I would like to hand it to the city council members. I am not against apartments, just that you require the developer to preserve the family-friendly streets of Carnation neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Um, Margaret Dietrich, followed by Stephen Earl, if, uh, who marked, uh, available to speak if necessary, so. Margaret Dietrich, um, this corner is so important to so many people because of its history. With the Bayless store and the Carnation uh, uh, dairy that used to be there, as well as the fact that this is a major intersection in Phoenix. 
and it deserves a really beautiful property. Now Toll Brothers builds nice property and originally they brought a quality product that was honestly rather boring. But they have put a lot of effort into making this worthy of that corner with a, a cladding that's similar to our punch card building at Central and Osborne and then um, on the bodega in the front of the building, the arches that are on the round building at Central and Osborne, although they've turned the arches right side up. And the other thing is about the tra So altogether, I think this is a worthy project now for this corner. And I live at Central and Encanto, and a half mile south of us is um, Central and McDowell. And since the Muse project has been there, I have not actually noticed any additional traffic. I think people that move into places like this tend to give up their cars in favor of having a really nice place to live because they often have to make that choice. And as far as the Third Avenue pro problem, I, I'm a kind of a cut through kind of person and Third Avenue has got speed bumps, and I don't cut through on Third Avenue. And I know they've worked with the people there to see that the, there's only a left turn out of it to go down to Indian School. So I think they've worked as hard as they can to keep the Carnation neighborhood from being annoyed with traffic. That's all, I'm in favor. Thank you so much. Mr. Earl. I don't walk quite as fast as I used to. Apologize for that. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, uh, Toll Brothers, with me tonight is Todd Bowden, who is the regional director of um, all multifamily projects uh, throughout the Western United States. He personally went after the Planning Commission to all of these residents, including Mr. Jenkins, to make them sh make sure they understood exactly how we would deal with Third Avenue. Because it had come up during the discussions. Now, the village voted in favor of this request, the staff's recommending its approval, and the Planning Commission is recommending its approval. There is a stipulation number 12 in, in the uh, recommended stipulations, which essentially says that we have to control the traffic at Third Avenue with diverters or other designs approved by the street transportation department and including a sign. We thought uh, that it might be important to look at a project just to the north of this project, which was built 20 years ago. It's called the station. Some of you may remember it. And it has access to Third Street. Going up to Monte Rosa, you can go then either way, either out to Central or to Third. Uh, they, that's been studied last Friday, peak hour movements uh, over the weekend and yesterday uh, and the day before. All of that study demonstrated that the trips that leave that project, which has essentially the same number of trips um, or, or units that we do, and virtually no one turned north into the neighborhood or west out to Third Avenue. Uh, the highly predominant movement was down to Indian School Road to get to the signal. So we believe that the people going north out of this project will be very rare, but because we're committed to this neighborhood and making sure that we don't have uh, errant movements going north, uh, we're, we're going to be working with the street transportation department and coming up with a design that, that physically diverts people toward Indian School Road and does not favor that right out uh, to go north. But the simple fact is that most people don't want to go north. <laughs> it's so easy to take either Indian School Road, we have two major access points to um, 
it's Indian School Road, and then we have this third. If I don't have control if you of would the button, give us but, your final thought. What's that? Would, uh, unless anyone has any questions, would you give us your final thought, Councilman DeCicio? Oh, thank you. And Steve, I just want to let you know you may have been moving a little slow right now, but you're still the sharpest guy in the room, for real. <laughs> well, no, you are. You're amazing. The you, amount so. of work that you do, and um, the, you're always been. You're an honorable individual, mm -hmm. and you're working with a great client with Toll Brothers. They always bring in great, great products. Um, but I also know the amount of work that you put into it, and Councilman Pastor put into this project. The fact that you have a complicated case like this, and you only have one individual. I want some of that. <laughs> Tell me how you did it, Laura, because it's obvious you did it right. So and we did get 100 letters of support for the project. Yeah, you've done an amazing job on something this complicated. And then one of the other things you might want to bring up if you get a chance to, I'd like to, the current zoning underneath it is a very intense zoning that could literally allow uses that you really don't want to see in that corridor. This is your entryway, your gateway into the downtown and the C3 zoning that you have on there right now could allow multiple other uses that could be problematic for that neighborhood. And all the things that you've done on behalf of protecting that neighborhood are quite exemplary. You know, thank you for doing that, Steve. Thank you, Sal. Um, we haven't shown our presentation, Mayor, uh, and I can show you a few slides, uh, if you wish, that shows the high quality nature of the project and how we did make a modern version of oh, the one moment, please, iconic uh, Council building. Woman. Steve. Yes, um, Councilwoman. I think if you could show for me right now, for Mr. Jenkins, if you could show the, the third. Avenue. Uh, yeah, the third avenue and what has been uh, added. Well, that, uh, that site plan that Alan just put up does show the third avenue. Um, this is the, I don't know if this document actually will allow me to highlight it, but it's at the far west end. And then uh, in addition to that, we created a, uh, <laughs> we're going through staff's presentation, but, <laughs> oh, and now we're getting, uh, is my, uh, oh, oh. Uh, Steve, just well, hold on one second. He'll, sw that, he'll switch over to your, your yeah. presentation. Mine loaded. I thought mine was loaded. Okay. It, it is, but they're, they're not consecutive. He's going to switch over just one second. Well, I was going to describe as we were switching over, but that's okay. So as uh, we're waiting, what I have to say is Toll Brothers uh, did hear uh, the community and also uh, heard uh, some of the, my recommendations that I felt were needed in the architecture and specifically on Central and Indian School on how that was a uh, corner that is changing rapidly and the fact that I wanted it to also be part of the neighborhood and the architecture to look like the neighborhood. And so they took a very mid-century uh, piece and was able then to add it on uh, or be able to replicate it uh, with uh, on Central and Indian School, along with very modern uh, apartments. Well, it looks like that slide did not right get. Right there, stop there. Right. This is Central look, Avenue frontage. If you look how the addition of the arches, uh, the architecture on Central and Osborne of the famous building uh, that sits there. I'm not touching a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going crazy. Yeah. But um, what I have to say is, uh, Sal, thank you for the compliment, but what I have to say is Toll Brothers and the community really worked hand in hand on creating uh, the space that it is today or will be in the future. Uh, I was just the behind the scenes because I really like when communities and neighborhoods uh, uh, work together with a developer and then I step in when it's very contentious. Uh, I also want to commend uh, everyone specifically on the Third Avenue and Mr. Jenkins, uh, we, your drawing is what's going to end up in uh, the stipulations. And stipulation 12, 13, and 14 we are speaking to that. In addition to that, I am asking for a very 
within the guideline or transportation guideline a high physical diversion so that it is, if anybody would want to make a right, uh, they will damage their car as they're making that right um, and be able to divert them to make their left. We are looking at a left, uh, left turn lane on that light and so I believe that all the questions and, and concerns of Mr. Jenkins has been answered. Um, and so, uh, Alan, I don't know if you have anything to say or because uh, you and I have been talking closely on this and, and so. So, uh, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, just uh, to clarify for the, the record, this particular case was not appealed for a public hearing, so we can't add any stipulations. Okay. But the comments that you just uh, provided are really direction to staff uh, in my department, the street transportation department, to work on uh, what that right turn uh, you know, divider would be to ensure that traffic goes south on Third Avenue. And so I will put together a meeting uh, with street transportation department and my staff uh, and bring the, uh, the exhibit that Mr. Jenkins uh, provided so that we can talk about that along with your comments, uh, you know, as direction on how we can look at trying to ensure that uh, we make it as difficult as we legally can for someone to uh, turn and go north on third. Yes, because I do, as, as you know, as many of you know, uh, Central City is growing and it is the core and we will continue or I will continue along with neighborhoods uh, to discuss uh, traffic and cut through and how we as a collective or as a city manages those, those pieces. And so we, I will be continuing uh, learning more and more about uh, diversion uh, in the neighborhoods but I think we have reached a great, to a great agreement um, and are able then to uh, move this uh, forward. So I want to make a motion, Steve. I'm just going to just make the motion. So I, I motion to approve uh, item 104 uh, along with uh, the comments that have, we have discussed with the physical diversions and looking at the light uh, to be included. Uh, Mayor and Which is uh, council Which is I mean, motion to approve it per the Planning Commission recommendation. Yes, That's all the, the steps that are before you and adopt the related ordinance. ordinance. Right. And I'll second that. With the what adopted. Alan said. Yeah, and I'll second <laughs> what Alan said. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Any comments? Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Pass is 9-0. Oh. Woo, Mary, you're with me. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor. Thank you. We next move to item 107, which is a case in Vice Mayor Waring's district. Um, we will, do, uh, shall we begin with the staff report? We will turn it over to our planning director for a brief staff report. Mayor, members of council, item number 107 is a rezoning case uh, Z8618-2, the northeast and southeast corners of Black Canyon Highway and Dynamite Boulevard. It is a request from S1 to Commerce Park, General Commerce Park for an 18-acre site. Uh, the proposed use is a recreational vehicle and boat storage facility on the southern portion. The staff is recommending approval per the Planning Commission recommendation uh, that comes before you uh, today. This is the uh, subject site. Uh, you can see it outlined here in yellow. You will recall that this uh, case was before you in a slightly different configuration back in July. At that time, the council remanded uh, the case back to the Deer Valley Village Planning Committee uh, to start the hearing process over again. The applicant did make a, a change at that time to swap out some of the land area here that we'll talk about in just a second. This is the general plan designation. It is a, a mix of Commerce Park uh, designation and multifamily residential 15 plus in this little half moon area that's bounded by the I-17 freeway and Skunk Creek Wash. 
that general plan amendment was uh, approved in uh, the early 2000s, and it is uh, what's on the general plan today and has allowed this area to develop over time with a mix of multifamily and commerce park uh, type uses. Uh, this is the zoning that shows within the area. So you have uh, multifamily residential up here on these sides. You have some uh, multifamily residential down here and then Commerce Park and a PUD that would allow a mix of uses down there. And then further off, single family residential on the other side of I-17 or off on the uh, other side of the Skunk Creek Wash area. This is uh, the difference from the original case that came before you in July where they were just looking at this for the boat RV storage area. What they uh, did was uh, reach agreement with the property owner back here to uh, swap this land so that that uh, gentleman will in the future develop this parcel up here. The boat RV storage area would be in for these two parcels right here. That did go through uh, the, the process um, to be reviewed and discussed. Uh, you can see the, the phase one is what we just discussed. Phase two is that future phase. There is a stipulation as part of this uh, request that requires that future phase to go through a public hearing process to have the site plan and elevations approved. Uh, that would be approved through the planning hearing officer and could ultimately be appealed uh, to the mayor and council uh, for a discussion about the site design and how that will look. The use would be approved if the council uh, approves this case today, but the, the hearing would just be about the site design. This is the proposed overall site plan. This is a, a cutout of the area. This is the, the piece to the north, and this is the proposed uh, RV uh, um, boat storage area. You see this is their proposed landscape plan that has a minimum 30 foot landscaping per stipulations along I-17. This is uh, one of the buildings on the site for the office uh, rental area. These are uh, some of the storage units that would be inside for some of the internal storage. And then up in this area is uh, the outside storage where you would have your um, RV parked underneath these canopies. Here's a rendering of what it would look like uh, from the I-17 uh, freeway frontage road. Staff does recommend approval per the Planning Commission recommendation and adoption of the related ordinance. Uh, in this case, it was approved unanimously by the Planning Commission. The uh, zoning case, when it went to the Deer Valley Village Planning Committee, uh, there was no recommendation uh, that came from the village when it went to, to them on uh, September uh, 19th. And uh, that was because there was not a quorum of the members who voted. They needed to have five members to either approve or deny an application uh, pursuant to uh, the Village Planning Committee handbook. They did not achieve that, even though there was a motion to deny and a motion to approve. Neither one garnered five votes, so officially there's no recommendation from the village. With that, staff's happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from our planning director before we open the public hearing? All right, we will open the public hearing. Each side will have up to 30 minutes to present and the, and we are, uh, uh, Vice Mayor, I believe we will begin with the applicant who could then reserve time at the end to respond to comments from the other side. And any comments before we begin? And I believe each side has a presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego and members of the council. My name is Heather Dukes, and I'm an attorney with Lazarus, Sylvan, and Bangs. We're located at 206 East Virginia Avenue. I'm here this afternoon on behalf of our client, Fortress uh, RV Storage, to request your approval of our application to rezone approximately 18 acres from the suburban S1 district to the Commerce Park District, General Commerce Park option, for purposes of developing this RV boat storage facility along the east side of the I-17 freeway between Di uh, Dynamite and also Joe Max Road. Our client, Mark Tiemann, is here as the representative of Fortress RV. The partner of my firm, Larry Lazarus, is also in attendance. And we also have our architect here, Nicole Poston-Thompson of On Point Architecture, to answer any questions. 
Since appearing before you in July of this year, our client has amended this rezoning application by negotiating a land trade to relocate its proposed RV boat storage facility farther south and farther away from the apartment development. As you can see from the aerial photographs on the screen, we are showing the current ownership of the properties as well as the prior location of the RV boat storage facility. Previously, we had proposed the facility to be in a north-south configuration along the I-17 freeway, and then these blue parcels were owned by a gentleman by the name of Fred Bishop. What we've been able to accomplish is we have now adjusted our site plan so that the RV boat storage facility has been pushed farther south. So on this side of the screen, you can see the yellow uh, boundary and that is where the RV boat storage facility will be located. The blue parcels will be acquired by Mr. Bishop and uh, at this time we are planning to rezone all 18 acres to the general commerce park option. Now the two blue parcels to the north will not have a site plan at this time. Mr. Bishop has not prepared um, to commission a site plan. Once he does that, he will be able to submit the site plan to the city and he will be required to go through the PHO process. What's unique about the PHO process is that once the application, the site plan is filed, it will be sent to the Deer Valley Village Planning Committee and they will have the option uh, to hear and, and uh, you know, have feedback, public hearing, public comment about his site plan, and then it will go to the planning hearing officer. Any appeals from the planning hearing officer are then heard and decided by the city council, which in this case is the same decision-making body for all rezoning cases. So it's a very similar process um, for those two parcels in the future. We feel this is an ideal site for an RV and boat storage facility being located along the I-17 freeway, along the highly traveled route to several national parks, lakes, and recreational grounds throughout northern Arizona. With frontage along the I-17, individuals can easily access the recreational vehicles to and from these various locations. The new RV boat storage site is comprised of three parcels, totaling approximately 13.14 gross acres. And both the I-17 and the Skunk Creek Wash serve as physical buffers, completely separating the site from single-family residential developments to the west and then also to the east. The full extent of Interstate 17 is approximately 350 feet wide, and the Skunk Creek Wash at this location is approximately 1,300 feet wide. These two barriers create almost an island at this location. Vehicular access to the property is limited to the freeway frontage road, connecting with the Joe Max Road interchange to the south and the Dixaleta Drive interchange to the north. An RV boat storage facility generates very little day-to-day -day activity and consequently very little traffic when compared to the other multifamily and general commerce park uses making this relatively low impact use suitable and compatible at this location. Alan went through the general plan. Once again, the, the maroon color shown on the screen um, designates multifamily residential. The light gray color is the commerce business park option. Because we are trying to rezone to the general commerce park option, it does conform with the general plan land use map. This request for General Commerce Park zoning is also compatible with its existing zoning in the area. On the east side of the I-17 to the south, there are parcels already zoned General Commerce Park and PUD districts, which are circled in green. The multifamily residential units are located north, circled in red. And there are two um, existing parcels right here to the south that are still zoned S1. And so with this general plan uh, designation of General Commerce Park and multifamily, it is likely that those two parcels will be rezoned in the future to be uh, consistent with those designations. Turning now to the site plan, and this one's dated September 9th, 2019, our amended site plan, Fortress RV is proposing to develop a premier high quality RV and boat storage facility consisting of 22 enclosed garages, and those are located right here along the I-17, 263 parking canopies, a sales office building, which is located right in this area, and that, that sales office building was designed with materials and colors which are compatible with not only the apartments but the single family uh, residential subdivisions in this area. And it will have a secure gated access. The clear height for all enclosed storage and canopy spaces will be 14 feet. The project has also been designed to minimize potential impacts to surrounding properties. For instance, the property is served with only one driveway access from the frontage road. And so we've placed our office building where traffic is gonna be coming in and out of the facility right at this midpoint. You have the apartments to the north and then you have two single family homes to the south. And so 
this office building, the driveway has been strategically located at that midpoint. At the request of the uh, Sage Apartments, we also moved our, um, our waste dump stations farther west to this area. And so once again, that's in the middle of the site, the middle of the development at the midpoint between the apartments to the north and the single family homes to the south. When measuring along the freeway frontage for the most part, the Sage Apartments are now located approximately 400 feet south. And I'm gonna point, because we've moved it farther south, there's a 400 foot distance now separating almost six apartment buildings from our location. Previously, our site plan had 970 linear feet because we bounded the apartments to the north and then also to the west. Now we only bound the apartments by 415 linear feet, which is in this location right here. And at that location, I wanna point out to you, that is the apartment pool and there's only one apartment building. So we went from being abutting you know, six apartment buildings to now only abutting one apartment building and their pool area. And located along this shared property line is an 11 foot retaining wall. So again, our land trade has really attempted uh, to work with the surrounding development, work with the apartments to come up with a better rezoning application. I also want to note that our project will comply with the noise and lighting requirements set forth in the Commerce Park District. In Section 626 G5 of the Zoning Ordinance, it requires us to have outdoor lighting that shall be shielded so that no source of illumination is directly visible from a public street or from residentially zoned property, and that light intensity does not exceed one foot candle on any adjacent residentially zoned property. We also have stipulation number 12 being recommended by staff, which is consistent with this zoning ordinance provision. You can also see from our photometric site plan that the light shed along the apartments here will be completely contained within our property. We have no light shed onto abutting properties. The noise on site must also comply with section 626 G3 of the zoning ordinance, which states that the average noise level measured at the property line shall not exceed 55 decibels when measured on a weighted sound level meter and according to the procedures of the EPA. So again, we will have to comply with the city's no noise ordinance. The project will be developed in two phases. The first phase will be on the west side of this green line here. Here, let me go back. Phase one will be in this location, and then phase two will be to the east of that green line. As shown by the preliminary landscape plan, significant landscape buffers are being provided along the perimeter of the project, with many buffers being in excess of City of Phoenix standards. We are providing 30 feet along the I-17, and then we're providing 20 feet along the north boundary of our site, 20 feet along the south boundary, and then in this area we're putting some of our on-site retention. I do want to note that that 20 foot setback to the north and south, that is in excess of the City of Phoenix requirement, which is only a five foot landscape requirement. Stipulation number one in the staff report requires general conformance with this setback exhibit on the screen, which includes setbacks for the two bishop parcels, which were those two uh, blue parcels that I mentioned previously. The bishop parcels are required to provide a 30-foot landscape strip along the I-17, similar to our development, and then he will also be required to provide a 20-foot landscape strip along the north, east, and south boundaries of his property. Again, that's in excess of the five-foot landscape requirement in the zoning ordinance, and he will be stipulated to meet those setbacks. This site line was prepared from the viewpoint of a second story balcony looking south towards the future Fred Bishop property and the RV boat storage facility, which is now farther south from the apartments. These are three inch caliper trees within that 20 foot setback, which provides significant screening. You will notice the parking canopies right here on the bottom part of the screen. Those parking canopies are on the apartment property. So what, the reason I point that out is on the apartment property, you do not have apartment buildings that are up against that adjoining property line. You have additional parking spaces for the apartments. So you're basically having parking now against the two uh, Fred Bishop parcels and then our development will be farther south by 400 feet. This is another viewpoint from the apartments looking west towards the Fred Bishop parcels. 
As Alan mentioned, um, this is a rendering of our office building and the front landscaped areas. As you can see, this is a high-end, high-quality development, both from a design and landscape standpoint. The Fortress RV project will be developed as an upscale RV and boat storage facility that surpasses the quality of most, if not all, the storage facilities in this area and throughout the city. The proposed elevations also demonstrate the attractive design and materials chosen for the sales office building and the entry gate. The quality design and materials are consistent with the apartments to the north and the single family neighborhoods in this area. And we've also provided you with the materials board for this development. As we mentioned at some of our prior hearings, we have hired CivTech to prepare an analysis of the number of vehicular trips generated by this proposed facility. Using information from the Institute of Traffic Engineers Trip Generation Manual and information obtained from the comparable RV boat storage facilities in the area, CivTech has determined that this use will generate approximately 44 trips per day during the week and 63 trips on the weekend. So 44 trips per day is 22 vehicles. This use will generate only 22 vehicles per day. If you look at some of the other uses that could be developed on this site with this zoning, you've got manufacturing at approximately 700 trips per day, research and development center at 1,800 trips per day, office park at 1,700 trips per day, and then apartments also at 1,700 trips per day. So when you compare that to our 22 trips per day, this is a very compatible use for this area. I want to place these trip numbers in context of the greater area. According to the ADOT 2018 average daily traffic counts, there are 111,189 vehicles that travel along the I-17 between the Dixaletta and Joe Max interchanges every day. As you can imagine, this creates a lot of activity and a lot of noise along the apartment frontage. In this case, we will be generating approximately 22 vehicles per day. And when you compare those 22 vehicles that travel to and from this boat storage and RV storage facility against the 111,000 trips, and vehicles on the freeway. It is highly unlikely that this use will impact the existing apartment residents or the surrounding area. I wanna talk briefly about the uh, unique traffic circulation in this area. As I mentioned, our, uh, our site has access from the northbound freeway frontage road. And that freeway frontage road, as it heads north towards Dixaletta, then turns east there's no way to head north on the I-17 at this location. So in order to head north on the I-17, you'd have to leave our site, which is at this yellow star, head north to Dixaletta, then head west, head south along the frontage road, head east along Joe Max, and then enter the freeway you know, to travel along those northbound travel lanes on the I-17. So it's very circuitous in this area, and that is another reason why it's not appropriate for a high um, generating traffic use such as employment centers and also more multifamily residential because the traffic uh, circulation at this location just will not support that, that amount of traffic. Because of these unique circumstances and the impacts to the homes on the west side of the I-17 that are created by that circuitous route, we have received several petition signatures from the west side of the I-17 in support of our rezoning case and the significantly no, low number of trips generated by this use. We have submitted 260 petitions and letters in support. The signatures on our petitions have been verified and compared against recorded deeds and residential rental certificates that are part of the public record. We have also received support from only two, well, let me, let me back up. In this area, there are only two single-family residential owners that abut our site, and it's Jim McDonald and Margie Wick, and Margie Wick is actually here today in support of our application. These homeowners um, have lived in their homes for almost 30 years, if not more, and we had an opportunity to sit down with them, to talk to them about our project, and they have submitted letters of support and are in support of our project. Fred Bishop, who is the person we're doing the land trade with, he initially was not in favor of this project because he was concerned that the development would cut off his access to the back, the two back parcels that he owned. We undertook significant negotiations with Mr. Bishop. We met with him several times, and we were able to come up with this land trade, not only for the benefit of Mr. Bishop, but for the benefit of the apartments and the benefit of our client. It was a win-win-win situation for all three parties. And so, again, he changed his position from being in opposition to our case to now being in support, and he submitted his letter of support for the record. 
Deb Fouts of the Prescott Valley Company is also in support of this case, and Deb's letter um, is, is significant in that she goes through the history of development um, at this particular location. And I just want to jump forward real quick to read a statement from her into the record, if I may, quickly. One of the things that's come up in the public hearings, um, the Sage Apartments have been asked, what use would you make of this site? What would you like to see developed here? And their consistent um, statement on the record has either been employment uses or more multifamily. And so Deb Fouts in her letter says that you may remember that less than one year ago, agents for Sage Luxury Apartment Homes were also opposed to another rezoning proposal in the immediate area, number Z45-18. In this case, the zoning requested was R3 for a proposed multifamily development known as the Villa at I-17 and Joe Max. In a letter dated August 1st, 2018, Mark Stirring, agent for Sage Apartments, cited various reasons they would strongly object to multifamily rezoning in the area. Objections included issues with increased traffic, capacity burdens placed on water and sewer systems due to peak demands. And then fast forward now to our case, uh, Deborah Fouts notes that at the Deer Valley Village Planning Committee hearing, Peggy Neely spoke on behalf of residents of Sage Luxury Apartment Homes, and per the minutes, Ms. Neely reiterated that she and the people she represents are opposed to this use, and if approved, it will deter other multifamily projects from moving into the area, which is what the neighbors would like to see in the area. And so we're getting some very inconsistent statements here where, again, multifamily is not appropriate with the traffic that's being generated, and the Sage Apartments have recognized that in prior cases. On October 1st, 2008, uh, I'm sorry, October 1st, 2019, we went through the list of concerns that we've heard from Sage Apartments. We put it in a letter um, to the Sage Apartments representative. We made it a part of the, of the uh, City of Phoenix files for this case. And we have worked very hard to resolve each and every single concern that's been raised in the public hearing process and during our meetings with the Sage Apartments. And again, that October 1st letter goes through um, all of our efforts uh, that we've made thus far. Lastly, I want to remind this council that we have not been through one, but two public hearing processes. We've had our first neighborhood meeting this case on December 20th of 2018. We then went to the Deer Valley Village Planning in Fe on February 21st. And what happened on February 21st is we ended up asking for a continuance. We got a letter, we got notice, well it wasn't a letter, it was notice from the apartments that they had not received our mailer for the first neighborhood meeting. So we voluntarily agreed to continue that Deer Valley Village Planning Committee meeting so that we could meet with the apartments. We continued to meet with the apartments through March, April, and then in May we finally went back to the Deer Valley Village. We presented our case. And there was no recommendation at that hearing um, because of a procedural error. On June 6th of 2019, we went to the Planning Commission hearing and received a 7-0 vote recommending approval of our case. On July 3rd, we then appeared before the City Council hearing, and it was at that time that we were requested then to go back through the public hearing process, not just one hearing, but all of the hearings. We had another neighborhood meeting um, to, to cure that procedural error that had occurred at the May 16th Deer Valley Village. And so these are these were our new hearing dates. Um, July 18th, we went back to the Deer Valley Village. We asked for a continuance so that we could work out this land trade. September 6th, we had another neighborhood meeting. September 19th, we went back to the Deer Valley Village and presented uh, information on our land trade. September, um, I'm sorry, October 3rd, we went to the Planning Commission hearing and once again received a 7-0 vote recommending approval. And here we are today before you. In closing, I want to bring the focus back to the merits of this case. This is truly a unique area that is isolated from single-family single subdivisions to both the east and west due to the substantial barriers that are created by the Skunk Creek Wash and then also the I-17. Traffic circulation is limited at this location due to the freeway configuration, which does not allow traffic to directly travel from the frontage road onto the northbound travel lanes of the I-17. These two features alone make this site inappropriate for high intensity, high traffic generating uses, such as an employment center, center or another multifamily development. An RV boat storage facility will generate only 22 cars per day, making it a compatible use.
There is also a very high demand for RV boat storage in this area. Several supporters of this project who signed our petitions noted that they wanted a place nearby where they could store their RVs and their boats because either A, they were tired of looking at those, um, you know, these, these boats and RVs being stored on other people's lots. They couldn't find a space in the area because all of the RV boat storage uh, facilities in the area are in high demand. Or B, they have, or C, I'm sorry, they have CCNRs that are recorded against the development which make it unlawful or uh, it's a prohibited use to store them on your lot. And finally, this is a, an appropriate use which conforms to the general plan as we showed you on the land use map. For all of these reasons, uh, we would request uh, your approval of this rezoning application, and I'd like to reserve my remaining time for rebuttal. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you. Looks like you have eight minutes, 45 seconds. Thank you. Although we, we will probably not pr promise precision down to seconds. Um, my understanding is that uh, we will next move to the other side, and that we'll, we'll begin with Stuart Kimball, followed by Peggy Neely. Mayor, City Council members, my name is Stuart Kimball. I'm actually here uh, as my role as a Village Planning Committee member uh, for the Deer Village uh, Planning Committee. Um, it has been, <laughs> to be honest, it, it's quite a shock. Um, I, I work in politics, mostly at the state, county, and some federal level. Uh, I don't do too much uh, with the city. Um, and, and it has been a quite shock in the process. The, the amount of misrepresentation of both fact and law uh, is an issue. Um, just to kind of go over a few, because they make comments that there were procedural errors or that somehow the reason why this process has changed is simply because uh, they decided to have a, a deal with the buyer uh, of some sort. The truth is they were violating state law, and the city staff was violating state law, and that was identified to them and they decided to go out there and prevent you guys from going there and having to deny it. Because had you heard the hearing on July 3rd and been able to get the information of both facts and law, the law, both city ordinance as well as state law, would have prevented you from being able to approve it. And you would have been required to deny it. And as a result, it would have triggered the city of Phoenix's policy that they can't come back for another year. Instead, they decided to bring it back, saying that they wanted to listen to people's votes, and that's what they told you. And I think the city council truly had the desire that it would go back and allow the village planning committee to, to participate and have it. In fact, what they did is they actually made it worse. They expanded the project. They modified it. They're making zoning changes without site plans that are there that, according to their own policies, you really shouldn't be doing that. But again, we find out that both city policies city ordinances, and state law are not an obstacle to getting something through. Uh, on a quick note, just because I wanted to identify one of the issues, uh, they, they talk about the traffic issues, and that's great. However, I don't think that's really an issue because as they accurately described, and I live about a mile and a half away from this project, um, there is a circuitous route uh, over there on the I-17. That is true. However, that problem did not stop the city of Phoenix for recommending single family homes on the other side of the freeway that had to do the exact same issue. So when they go there and tell you that, oh my gosh, we shouldn't allow housing and this makes no sense and this is why this project is the best, it makes zero sense given what the city is actually doing outside of this case. Just to kind of give you a hint of the procedural error that occurred. In fact, the voice of the village planning committee is not being heard at all. Neither is the voice of all the citizens who take time out of their busy days to come down there, regardless if they're for or against it, and they kind of get just as bad as your guys' meetings, although you guys have cops, uh, we don't. Uh, I think I was accused last time for supporting development and told that blood were gonna be on my hands because of the amount of cars. So I understand some of the concerns you guys were dealing with today, uh, and I'm grateful I'm not an elected official. However, as a public officer, I do have obligations, and one of my obligations is to comply with state law, and that's not being done. And I've raised it with city staff, I've raised it with the city attorney. In fact, I have the city attorney on record on two separate occasions admitting that it's violating state law. 
And Mr. Kimball, could you give us your final thought? We have a very large number of oh, people here who wish well, to speak. Well, I, I think if Peggy wouldn't mind, and the reason why is because July 2nd, the day before your guys' hearing, Alan Stevenson decides he wants to go out there and provide you guys legal analysis. Your city attorney doesn't. He refuses to this day to provide the legal opinion that the village planning chair has asked for. I've asked for as a village planning committee member. But here's the key thing that's clear. Alan does note, the state law and city code mandate that the PC follows certain procedural requirements and failure to comply with these requirements may prevent city council consideration of a rezoning application. That is absolutely true. They go there and they qualify it and they say, well, no, it's only these notice procedures. But in fact, as we have your lawyer admitting on record that it's not just that, his own presentation he provides to us but won't actually give us a copy of admits that, you are prohibited from considering this because the state law procedures have not been done. And that is a problem. And the shenanigans have gone on. We've had city, Alan Stevenson himself has unilaterally canceled a village planning committee meeting to avoid us from getting together and addressing these issues. We had the city staff go out there and admit that, hey, a supervisor came in and changed the decision and it Mr. Was above Kimball, their your time rate. has concluded. Thank you for your testimony. Oh, Ms. Mayor, Neely. Mayor, I want to ask a question, though, too, Stuart. We've known each other for quite a few years. So, Stuart, your contention, so I want to make sure so that the audience understands exactly what we're talking about. You're saying that every zoning case that we've done in the city of Phoenix is illegal, correct? According to state law, yes. Right. So every zoning case, so we've had five, I think, five zoning cases come up today. They were all illegal. Yeah, from the city of and it, but unfortunately your lawyer hasn't told you so you're not as a public officer like i'm a public officer as part of the bpc you don't have personal liability because obviously you guys didn't know that and well, your lawyers aren't telling you this you have staff providing legal recommendations and the city attorney is refusing to provide the legal opinions that state law requires to protect it and the other thing too is i mean until you came up upon this, so I'll give you that, I'll grant you that, but then every case that you vote on because the Village Planning Committee is also illegal. And, and that's for that reason we have abstained, and that's why you see when they abstained from it, it's because when they got the information, they've been asking for a legal opinion so they can do the right decisions. So and it hasn't been forthcoming. And, and Councilman DeCicio, yeah, this is the reason why it's problematic. That isn't just the only shenanigan that has occurred. We've had council members reaching out to other public officers on behalf of the applicant to sway their vote. We've had city staff changing and deleting and removing conversations and questions from the reports. We've gone out there and we've had unilateral closure of meetings so we can't actually get together to hear. The shenanigans aren't just a single one. All of them should be addressed. But this case, for whatever reason, has gone out there and they have been able to do whatever they want. The reason why, and I hopefully I can admit this, the reason why they changed it is because they actually violated their own stipulations on that very first plan approval. That's why they had to change it. They were trying to sell the northern portion of the property on that very original one. Here's the opening done. You can see the date on July 3rd, the same date we had the meeting. Yeah. Alan Stevenson but, was aware of it, and yet so, none of that came to the city council. But, so, but, unfortunately, staff is making decisions, mm -hmm. choosing and selecting but, what should be provided to the city council members and doing it. And I think that's not only a disservice to you, it's also a disservice to so, all the people who actually think that the village planning committee and community involvement is actually a legitimate process that should be considered so, just like the city claims that they So will. let me, I'm gonna ask staff, have we had a village planning meeting since this thing was voted on? Has there been one since then for his village? Mayor, Councilman Asisio, yes. And then did the, how did the, did they vote on things? So uh, Mayor, Councilman Asisio, they uh, did vote this last meeting that they had uh, the uh, Paul Lee, the city attorney who represents Planning Development Tour, and myself went to the village uh, to provide a, an e-session discussion with them about some of the concerns that Mr. Kimball had raised. We provided that in uh, e-session because it is, uh, you know, a legal discussion. Uh, Mr. Kimball was there for part of that but did leave, but then subsequent to that, uh, they had a regular agenda item that was discussed, uh, you know, afterwards uh, on that agenda. And, and so have they voted on zoning cases in that village since uh, that time, uh, or are they going to? Ma Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, yes. Uh, the sentiments that we heard uh, that night and the, the vote 
On the other case after that, they did uh, you know, motion to, I think that case was approved and is working its way through the Planning Commission and will land on your guys' doorstep in December. So if Mr. Kimball was correct today, I, we're going to disagree on this point because I've met with staff on the same thing. Every zoning case we've done in the city of Phoenix is illegal and no vesting, no nothing could have occurred outside of this just, uh, just this one case because he's talking about not just this case, he's talking about every zoning in the, in the city of Phoenix that we've ever done is illegal, correct? Mayor, uh, Councilman DeCicio, uh, he, uh, he started out making the allegations relative to this case, but has expanded those to say that he believes all of those, uh, as just as he stated in his testimony, that it's all zoning cases. Staff has reviewed that, has discussed it with the law department, and we believe we're in compliance with uh, the state law and the zoning ordinance. Thank well, you. well Thank then, you. Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, if one, it would be possible for me to explain my own views rather than well, city I mean, staff doing it. But not, what, I, what I've requested and has been refused me, even though I'm a public officer of the city of Phoenix, is a written legal opinion yeah. in order to justify it. They refuse to do so. And in fact, I have two recordings of the city attorney acknowledging that you're violating the law. So you can have people go there and disagree with what the law is. Mm -hmm. But again, the great thing about the law is there are some plain meaning terms, and if you're not complying with it, I'm the one who also went there and offered it, and you are well aware of this, Councilman DeCicio, of going there and solving the problem. The problem is, is contrary to the request, and I believe it was Councilwoman. But Stuart, um, are you taking time away Pastor. from your side on this? Because that, these well, are not questions I've asked. So I just want to make sure that I, it's all fair. I assume that you and making statements about my position so would be I'm done with fair questions. Councilman, I think if we are going to make dramatic changes to our process, which I currently believe is, is right. legal, but this is not the appropriate venue, and that we have people who are here to testify. I, I, that's what I'm saying. Is that on you this only have specific time. case. Uh, thank you, Mary. No, I agree. I'm just so, saying, I just want to make sure because we have other people here too. Right. So my preference would be now to hear from uh, Peggy Neely and residents who have come to share testimony. If we do, I feel confident in our current process, but if we do need to make changes, we do not have the appropriate stakeholders here today. No, I'm contending that we've done everything legally. Right, I agree right. with you. Mm -hmm. We have a very solid planning staff and I appreciate their hard work on this case and, other, and generally. The, the first slide up. Um, we're going to have three of us speak presentation wise and we hope to finish up sooner than 20 minutes. Then maybe you can take five minutes worth of other opposition comments if you want. Um, so with that, I'm going to have Mark Highland start. Wonderful. And we do have a PowerPoint Mark. presentation, is that right? Yes. Have it? Okay. Too much slide? Yeah. They downloaded them. Okay. There you go. Right. Uh, my name is Mark Hyland. I'd like to speak towards a few few topics on this uh, on this rezoning. First is the, the city's master plan, land uses, and goals. Uh, the city's stated goal is a balance between housing and jobs, and this does not meet either of those things. It, it most is going to generate a few jobs and no housing. Um, the Deer Valley's brochure states it has a principle is to balance housing and employment. Again, we don't see that happening here. A commerce park would provide numerous well-paying jobs. Uh, we do some rough calculations. We're looking at probably about 275 jobs on their site, uh, probably closer to 600 if the whole area is developed as a commerce park. Uh, for high-density housing, uh, you're looking at probably about uh, 200 and, or sorry, about 160 houses, uh, maybe closer to uh, 500 when it's all done, if everything got developed in that area. Um, now, I do admit that we do have a letter out there where we did question the traffic at the previous uh, um, multifamily use, but that's because there was no effort made to mitigate the additional traffic. So we recognize that it would be a benefit to this area to have additional housing or a commerce park, but we'd like to see some mitigation for the traffic. There's some things that could be done to improve it. Um, regarding our site design, we were actually required to leave room for a cul-de-sac for these road extensions because these were necessary to help fully develop the area and to limit the number of curb cuts on this service drive. So if we get rid of the two roads that we're going to eventually service this area, now you're looking at a lot of per parcels that are going to have individual curb cuts, which in most cases traffic uh, folks like to limit the amount of curb cuts onto, onto, uh, onto roads. Uh, so we were left with this cul-de-sac. Um, we had to omit some parking. We had to build some curved walls, add a couple of gates, and 
leave this nice quarter circle there. Now we're being told it's not necessary. Um, we designed our site. We brought water and sewer up through multiple properties and across the wash to serve this area as it would be fully developed. If we're not going to develop it as Commerce Park and we're not going to develop it as homes, then what we've got here is a, a pretty good sewer system and water system that's not going to be served to its fullest capacity. And we're going to have a piece of, uh, of what was going to be a future road that's going to be kind of hard to reclaim for us, a little expensive. Um, also, this development's going to restrict some of the future development of the rest of the area. If we have, in actuality, four parcels to the south, each parcel has two different uh, Sidwells and different owners, two different parcel ID numbers. So if the front parcel is developed, the uh, front two parcels are developed, the back two aren't, this site only leaves 20 foot easement to get to those parcels in the back. Now, it takes 60 foot for a road. Are we expecting then that the southerly homeowner is going to, out of the generous nature of themselves, going to dedicate an additional 40 feet, 200% more than this site's dedicating, to give a road to the back parcel? Otherwise, the, this, the remaining parcels in the rear are going to be left without the access they need. It's just going to be a, a single family parcel for the rest of its existence. Uh, we've been here a long time in Phoenix, and we've made a pretty substantial investment in this area. We've got phase two coming up, which right now we're kind of on hold until we see what happens here. Uh, Sarah's going to talk to that a little bit more. Um, but I'd just like to point out that this, this use isn't consistent with the goals or the master plan uh, or the stated the desires of the community, and that's what we based our whole development on. Uh, some of the points I'd like to make about the site plan itself, uh, at least the traffic study that I had seen started with a disclaimer that they had no real traffic data about this use. So all the analysis is going to be based on speculation. Uh, what I can tell you is this traffic is not going to be spread out over the day. Nobody starts their recreational vacation, you know, Wednesday at noon. You're going to have people driving there in the morning to pick up stuff, driving there in the evening to pick up stuff during rush hour. Um, the hours are stated as 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. Well, I don't know if anyone's heard a dirt bike start up or get revved, but you can bet if somebody's going to come and pick up their vehicles and take them out to the desert or take their boat out or jet skis out to the lake, they're going to start them to make sure they run. They're not going to just drive an hour or two or three crossing their fingers that they're going to start. That's what we object to. This is going to generate a lot of loud noise at 5 or 6 in the morning when people are sleeping. People are just starting to get up. And I don't think that's an appropriate use in this area. Um, so I, I think part of the, the concern there is that we're not going to have traffic spread out all over the day. It's going to be in a few hours in the morning, a few hours in the evening, and it's all going to be like Friday night, Saturday morning, or Sunday night. That's when everyone else is kind of winding down from work getting ready for the next week. So this site, you're going to have, you have apartments, you have single family homes, you have the, the duplexes to the south. It's residential around it. And we're going to put this noise generator in the middle of it. I don't think that's a good point. All right, so and then just the last, the regards to the letter, uh, we have had a couple of contacts with the applicant. We've discussed some of our concerns. The problem, the disconnect is, is that we, um, Never get to see what their final decision is beforehand to make comments on how it might be approved. We only get to say, well, we have these concerns, and then all of a sudden there's a plan that's been submitted. Uh, for example, this new one, um, you can see all their driveways are now pointed towards our site. If you're making noise and you've got vehicles on both sides of the driveway, all the noise goes right into our property. Uh, they said that they swapped over 60% of the land, but if you look at the picture, they took the corner that is going to be Fred Bishop's parcel out, and then they just moved it over to our south property line. So the actually a larger number of acres is in the same proximity to our site. It didn't improve it, it just added more acreage in the same vicinity to, to make noise. So they did do a lot of work towards this, but without additional consultation, it didn't actually solve problems. In some cases, it, it made it a little bit worse. So that's one of our other concerns. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah. 
Mayor, council members, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I know it's been a long day for everyone, um, so I will make my comments as concise as possible. Um, we do have just a quick PowerPoint. Um, you've heard everyone refer to SAGE and the apartments. I'd like to just shed a bit more light on what that really means. The owner and operator of Sage, Michigan-based company that has invested heavily in Arizona for many, many years. They've been developing here since 1973. Sage is a $50 million investment in the community. And as Mark mentioned, we do have entitlements to build an additional 225 apartments directly north. That would represent approximately a $40 million construction cost and impact fees of about $5 million. Um, that project is somewhat on hold at this stage. It's all contingent upon the values of SAGE and the rents that we can get, rents that we are really concerned about if storage goes in next door. Um, perhaps even more important, um, the owner operator currently employs 130 full-time employees in Arizona, 90% of which are in Metro Phoenix. We are under construction with additional upscale residential communities in the market that will represent another 110 employees um, to be hired in 2020, so good things coming. Everybody can see the proposed site. The orange star at the top of the, the slide is what's most important. That represents a building in Sage that is approximately 50% of the distance between the applicant's proposed land and our site that is further north. Here's why that's important. To our knowledge, the applicant hasn't been within the gated community of Sage. You'll see an orange arrow pointing to a tree in this picture. That tree is approximately 23 feet tall. We saw, and I couldn't tell if it was a rendering or a photo, um, the applicant had a picture of the view from a second story residence. I think it's important to note that we are three story buildings. So we have over 100 residences that would be a floor above the photo and the view that the applicant showed. There is a difference in elevation between Sage and the land directly south. Um, assuming they plant trees that are 20 feet tall in their buffer, uh, that would provide a seven foot difference between the tree that is shown and the tree that they're providing. So our tree is actually seven feet taller. You can see from this building, we look directly into that land. We would look directly over the carports. And I think it's worth noting, I didn't cherry pick the best unit to show the worst view I could have. There are eight residential buildings that are located in much closer proximity to the applicant site than this one. With that in mind, um, I want everyone to see what the views would look like. These are Google images, covered RV storage, current photos in Phoenix. This is what the view would look like. I think it's important to remember the reason that people chose to live in that zip code and chose the environment that the general plan provided for. These are the existing USAA offices less than two miles directly south of Sage. We have many residents, many voting residents that work at USAA. We have renters that are renters by choice. Some of them are products of divorced families. One spouse may continue to own a home in the area. The other resides in the apartments. Their children attend the schools in the area. They love the tranquil setting that the community and the surrounding residential provides. They didn't know that they could potentially be living next door to storage and things that are typically further south. With that in mind, this is a Google map of Sage Apartments. You can see the surrounding businesses that presently exist. This is unedited. You have Sage, you have upscale condominiums, you have single family home developments, you have both charter and public schools, you have churches. This is an unedited business map of the RV and boat storage that already exist five miles directly south. You have scrap metal, you have used car dealerships, and you have good old Castle Boutique. <laughs> we all know what that is, I don't need to elaborate. No judgment. All right, with that in mind, we heard the applicant talk about the need for storage in the area, so I did just a bit of homework. I called multiple storage facilities that exist, including the two that are highlighted on that map, again, five miles directly south. 
Here is one of the, the storage facilities that I called. You'll note the arrows at the bottom. They are offering a 50% off special for the first couple of months on their covered RV storage. They have plenty of availability. Here is the second, and I apologize, my eyes, aren't, my eyes are good, but they're not that good. But this is Premier Storage. They said they had availability and could get me in the next day. Here's the third that was also indicated on that map. Brand new storage, they're trying to fill up, they offer specials and they could also get me in immediately. So there's plenty of storage and availability. Last but not least, we saw the opposition, excuse me, we saw the map in favor of the storage facility. Um, based on what the applicant's attorney said, I believed that they had 260 votes. Um, this is our counted opposition map. We have 720 votes in op, I shouldn't say votes. We have 720 people that have signed in opposition of the project. And I think what's most important to note is that 78% of those people are not residents of SAGE. These are people that are homeowners that live in the surrounding areas. Um, one other thing, if I can just quickly get back to my first slide. So we mentioned SAGE, of course directly north of this site. We mentioned the two single family residences directly south. What nobody mentioned is that directly south of those two single family residences, uh, bungalows on Jomax currently being constructed. It is more multifamily residential that will flank this storage to the other side. It's already going in, they're set to open soon. So I can only imagine that the opposition signatures would increase once people are living there. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark and um, Sarah. I'm Peggy Neely, and I'm here today. Um, I haven't gotten to plead in front of you how we feel about this case. But Sage Apartments is definitely an investor in this area. They have been. I believe that uh, it was acquired in 2004, built out in 2009. It's a $50 million investment. And I'm sure many of you read the article in the paper a couple weeks ago that for you to keep up with the growth uh, that's happening of 200 people a month in the valley, you're going to have to have 10,000 multifamily units built between now and 2030 each year. So our folks are looking at this as something that we're concerned that this is not an appropriate use. We believe that the uh, general plan really does specify that, yes, it can be uh, residential, employment's good, and Commerce Parks does fall in there. And with a special permit, uh, they can build their self-storage. We don't believe it's the appropriate place. It's not compatible. And as we'd gone through the process, I find it very interesting that many people believe that residents of apartment dwellers are not voters and don't count. Well, they pay taxes and they do count. And as Sarah said, they don't live there because of necessity. They live there because of choice. And these folks, um, we have numerous residents and some employees today, so if they'd please stand up, I'd really appreciate it. I just want to show you what you have. I think it's a pretty good turnout of people that are concerned about this issue. Thank you, guys. Um, and why I'm here is because we have now gone out and secured additional signatures of people that are opposed. And Sarah didn't quite leave it where I need it to be. I want to be on this one. Um, and if you have any questions about who secured our signatures, we have the person in the audience that would be more glad to talk to it. We only have one star on the property at, um, at Sage, but over 160 signatures came from that area. You can see it right above the star. So in addition to all of those, you have one other uh, group of 160 homes, 721 people that are opposed. So I would say to you that this is not a compatible use. It's not the place this should be. Several of the uh, applicant's signatures came up and around Sonoran Foothills, 
and Tremonto. And that's five miles to the north. Um, and they really were supportive of RV storage. Well, maybe you, they could look for a site up in that area, but the neighbors are saying no. We're representing that group. We're saying this is not appropriate. Um, and I just want to talk real quickly about the trade and how that scares me. Now, I did enough zoning cases that I'm dangerous, but the thing that scares me here is we're just going to put Commerce Park on it, and we don't get to say what's going to go there. It could be an ugly, ugly use. What they told you, if you listen real quick, closely, oh, well, you can look at the architecture, they can comment on that, but it'll go through the hearing officer, and then the council can look at it, and they can comment on the landscaping, how the design is. You cannot comment on the use. That is a problem. Why would you take away the rights of the residents to be able to decide what's going to go there? They can do a trade, but why does it need to be in this project? It should not. This is a failed application. So again, I want to thank you for your time. I want to say, I'll use appropriate language. My, my bum is sore, so I can't imagine what you guys is. is. So we're going to wrap up. Thank you all for your time. Please vote to oppose this application. Councilman DeCicio. Thank you. Uh, Peggy, if you don't mind. So I want to see if you agree or disagree with this. I mean, you heard Stuart Kimball come up here and say that every zoning case that we do here and zoning cases and other clients that you have is illegal. Do you believe that our, um, our zoning process is illegal? No. Okay. And I'm glad you said that because it makes him an outlier here. Uh, basically, he's on his own. So the, the point I want to make to you too, and I think you would have been a lot better off doing this, this whole personal attack on city staff, on a process that we all, and I'm just letting you know, I mean, Stuart's part of your team, or that's how I he see it. He is not part of our team. Okay, well. And let, I'm not I, sure I, where you got me, that. All right, well, either way, I'll, I'm just gonna be really direct about it. By making it personal, you guys had a shot at maybe getting some of us uh, to think about this, but this personal attack, this attack on making us all basically, Ill, making everything that we do here illegally, I think was a bad move. I think it was a personal move. It was wrong. It should never have occurred. You should have stayed on the, uh, the use itself. But I'll tell you from my end of it, I am not happy with the way that this thing, these personal attacks have done. We see too much of it on Washington, D.C. We see it too much at, at another level. It was completely unnecessary what occurred here. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm good with this case. And that's where I'm well, at let right me, now. Well, let me because just. Because what has occurred here, I think, is deplorable. Let me just respond. I know Stuart, as a member of the village, you could say as much this, that these folks brought Stuart. I didn't bring Stuart. I am not copied on one email, and I've heard about the barrage of stuff. It had nothing to do with us. We are saying we're opposed. Now, if he falls in that category, okay, but we are opposed. I'm sure they talked to the village as much as I did, probably more because I heard the comments that were said. So let's just straighten the record, Sal. Stuart is not on my team. Stuart came up there and said, can I please speak first? Well, I don't have anything to do with it, so I told Penny, Stuart wants to speak first. So that's where it's out, well, Sal. Uh, don't you, you don't your, paint you me bring, with the brush you bring that I'm here with his team. You up front, Peggy, is what you do. So I'll, I'll end it with this. But the bottom line is, you were wrong. You should not have done what you guys did. It was wrong. Period. It was not us. Thank you. Uh, would the applicant like to make any concluding comments? Yeah. Heather Dukes. Thank you, Mayor Gallego, members of the council. I want to limit my uh, rebuttal comments to the land use um, in this application. 
I want to address the fact that the general plan has a policy and a goal, and also this village has a po policy and a goal where you have this balance of housing and jobs. That is, that is in the general plan, but that's not the only part of the general plan. There is the land use map, which designates this area for general commerce park zoning. This RV boat storage use is a permitted use in general commerce park zoning. So we not only are compatible with, or I'm sorry, we conform to the land use map, we also meet other goals and policies um, throughout the general plan. And with this, sit with this site being so unique between the wash and the I-17 freeway and the limited traffic circulation, not every location in this village is going to be appropriate for employment use. It's not going to be appropriate for a huge multifamily development. And so that's what we're trying to get across here. Sage Apartments, um, they expended a lot of money at their location. They installed some water and sewer infrastructure in this area. We are not minimizing the amount of money that they spent on their project, and it's a beautiful project. What we are here doing today is we are asking for your approval of a compatible land use that's compatible with SAGE. And they have not presented any evidence. Instead, it's been mere conclusory sentences that A, this is gonna generate noise, and B, this is not compatible. But there is not one, one element of truth to any of those statements when you look at the record, when you look at the zoning ordinance uh, sections that we've presented, when you've reviewed the stipulations of approval that staff is recommending, we have to meet a noise ordinance. We have to meet a lighting ordinance. Um, we have a traffic study from a traffic engineer which states that the number of trips that we will generate uh, will basically be 22 cars per day. And so when Sage Apartments Make, they make accusations that this is going to be a noisy use at 5 a.m. in the morning. They are next to an I-17 freeway with no sound wall. There's no sound wall. Those 111,000 trips per day are going back and forth past their site. And so the amount of intensity, the amount of noise that's being generated just from that freeway alone, our use is very compatible for this area. I want to briefly um, go to the petitions, and if I can have the clicker. <coughs> the petitions in opposition that were submitted were approximately 700, um, but we need to call into question those petitions for several reasons. First, um, several of them are duplicates and triplicates. Uh, Mark Tiemann, our client, went down to the city of Phoenix, went through the city's records, and he found multiple instances where the same uh, resident, uh, the same apartment resident, the same property owner had signed these petitions in opposition. So there are not 700 total, there are several duplicates and triplicates. I also want to call into question the statements on the recent petitions that were submitted to you. There are five statements on this petition, and they're either false, misleading, or erroneous. I want to first address the statement that stop the senseless development and protect the gateway to the Phoenix Preserve. The Phoenix Preserve, the Sonoran Preserve, is almost two and a half miles to the northeast of this site. This is not at a gateway to a preserve. There is no preserve in this area. There is a wash and a freeway that separates this development from single family residential homes in the area. And then you have the, Nor the Sonoran Preserve uh, very far to the northeast. So that one, that statement is not accurate. It also states here um, that there will be a major increase in traffic. Well, according to our traffic engineer, there will be an increase of 22 cars per day. So that is not a major increase in traffic. There will be noise from large motor homes and boats along the narrow frontage roads on I-17. Again, there's no evidence that there will be noise generated from these large motor homes. People come to this location, they're going to hook up their trailers, they're going to drive away with their motor homes, they're gonna hook up their boat trailers and go on their vacations, they're gonna bring them back. This is a very quick process. Mark has um, procedures, requirements in place where there will be no revving of engines allowed. Um, and so we have measures in place to combat the noise issues that are being raised by Sage Apartments. It also states that because the storage yard would operate early in the morning and late into the night, the bright lights would negatively impact the surrounding neighborhood. There is um, adequate landscaping being provided around the perimeter of this project. I've shown you our photometric plan where there's no light shed that goes to the adjoining properties. In addition, I'm gonna go back to the freeway. You have 
a significant amount of traffic with headlights traveling along the I-17 when there's no barrier between the I-17 and these apartments. So they're already being impacted by a substantial amount of noise and lights on the I-17. And it also says that this type of use in this area will negatively impact property values. We had a broker recently look at, um, it's the RV Hideaway development. It's north of the 101 and east of Cave Creek Road, and it was developed uh, by 2004. And what um, our broker did is he evaluated land sales in years one through four, right after the RV Hideaway development uh, was constructed. And what this chart shows is that the price per square foot in those years one through four actually increased when, once that development was in place. And so again, this statement that this type of use in this area will negatively impact property values, there's no evidence to that effect. And so the point I'm trying to make is whether they submit 100 petitions or 1,000 petitions with these statements on them, they're not accurate. They went to the voters, they went to these homeowners, they went to these residents in this area and provided them inaccurate information, and that's what these people signed. So what we have presented to you today are facts, a compatible land use, and a request for a rezoning approval that has several stipulations that have been recommended by staff and that have received unanimous approval from the Planning Commission. And at the last Deer Valley Village Planning Committee meeting, we received vo four votes in support, one opposed, and three abstentions. And so if you look at the village membership that was present at our last Deer Valley hearing, we had four supporters, more so than the other votes um, you know, that, were, that were being requested that, that evening. So I am going to cut off my time and um, ask you again for your support of this case. And if you have any questions at this time, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Any council member questions? We will close the public hearing. Vice Mayor, this is in your district. Do you have a motion? I do. I'm going to make a motion to deny. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mayor. Councilman Nokowski. You know, um, I have some questions. Um, they talked about it being a gateway into the preserve. Is that true or not, Alan? Uh, Mayor, Councilman uh, Nowakowski, I don't know that there would be uh, any designation of a gateway into the preserve that the city has designated. It certainly is uh, a property that's visible along I-17, but the preserve uh, that is both east and west of this I-17 area uh, the, is further back to the east, um, you know, around the 19th Avenue and going over to 7th Avenue uh, area is where you would actually see the preserve starting. And I also heard that it was right next to a freeway with not, is there a sound wall or no sound wall or, and is the apartments right next to a freeway? <laughs> Uh, Mayor Councilman Nowakowski, it is right next to a freeway. Uh, there is no sound wall on the um, east side of the freeway, but I believe there's a sound wall on the west side of the freeway where there are the single family homes. Or and at least some portion of that uh, single family development has a noise wall. And I remember when it first came to us, there was actually six apartment complexes or the buildings that were gonna be affected. And now with the land swap, we were informed that there was only one building and a swimming pool that would be right next to this uh, storage uh, facility. Is that true? Uh, Mayor Councilman Nowakowski, uh, the, the site plan, once it was amended, uh, has the boat and RV storage along that south property line where the Sage Apartments has just one building and uh, a, a swimming pool. Mayor, after um, hearing uh, the testimonies from both sides and after seeing that our staff worked and there was some compromise there and it's sort of like a, there's not a real win-win situation here, but I'd like to do a substitute motion to go along with um, staff's recommendation and going with the approval of the October 3rd adoption of um, the related ordinances that were worked out. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion of the 
Motion. Mayor, council uh, members, I just clarify, I believe it's per the Planning Commission recommendation uh, from the October. I just want to make sure Thank you. it's in the record. Thank you. Any further discussion? Roll. I'm sorry, Councilwoman Stark. Can I, can I just say something about the process? I, I think Sal's right. We've done this a million times, and it's not illegal. As a matter of fact, the city of Phoenix has enhanced their process. Through state law, cities and towns and counties are required to go to the Planning Commission and to their governing board. Phoenix went above and beyond and created village planning committees, largely because of the size, but we, our process is just like any other jurisdiction in the state of Arizona, and I do think our staff does a great job. Thank you, and I, I agree completely. We have a very solid process. As someone who served as a village planning commissioner, it is a great way to get the community involved and get feedback. Our staff does a great job. It is not easy being the planning department in the fastest growing city in the country, and we really appreciate our planning director and the excellent professionals who work with him. So I think today we will all vote based on what we think is the appropriate land use decision. And that is very, very important. Roll call. Tosizio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? I'm gonna vote no and, and stand with our vice mayor. Thank you. Williams? No, I'm gonna stand with the council person and vice mayor. Waring? No. Gallego? No. So the motion fails five to four. So now we have to go back to the end. Because the first motion has failed, we now go back to the original motion made by the vice mayor. So this will be a motion, and I expect the same outcome, but we will need to vote on the vice mayor's original motion. So a yes vote is now a vote to deny. Roll call. Decisio? No. Garcia? No. Guardado? No. Nowakowski? No. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Williams? Yes. Waring? Yes. Gallego? Yes. This motion passes five to four. We will now move to the public citizen comment portion of our meeting. Elizabeth Venable will be followed by Lorenzo, and I apologize, I, I think it's Stoutmeyer. Yes. We did okay? Okay. That sounded Thank you for those of you who remain to listen to our comments. I appreciate that. Um, I am commenting as usual on two um, rulings from the Ninth Circuit. One, which I've commented a lot, um, which is Martin v. Boise, which um, all of the Western cities are appealing 
uh, to the su Supreme Court, so I, I understand why you are reluctant to act upon that. However, I wanted to bring up the topic of Levon v. City of Los Angeles, because regardless of the outcome in Martin v. Boise, you have to follow Levon. It's not, um, it's not going to the Supreme Court. It's not going anywhere. And what is the current situation outside of CAST is every single Wednesday, there's a gigantic truck which drives through CAST, escorted through the area around CAST, escorted by police. And these police tell people, and sometimes to their faces, sometimes these police have people relinquish their items, as was told to me by several people, they will tell people to relinquish their items before they are put into this big truck. Uh, furthermore, they're supposed to be stored as uh, evidence of camping or something like that. Evidence of what? It has to be evidence of camping, right? Um, and uh, if it's being stored as evidence, um, where is it going? If it's all being thrown into one truck all together, how can you tell whose is what? How can you tell what is what? How can people access their things after they are put into this truck? And that's, uh, we have a person that had been ordered not to touch her things, and she desperately wants to know where her things went to when they were taken from her when she was ordered not to touch them. And, um, and so I think this is a very important matter that you, <coughs> excuse me, are not addressing. Um, these people have the right to have possessions. I mean, I know that sounds silly, but they have the right to have possessions. They have the right to have possessions in public. I have a car, I park it some places. It's not the cleanest of cars, but I'm allowed to park it almost anywhere I choose. It is my possession and I have possessions inside of it. I do not have to be in it for it to not be seized. I. Had, you respect my possessions. We should also respect the possessions of the homeless. Okay, so it's not appropriate to have a gigantic truck where the possessions of the homeless are just tossed in willy-nilly, you know, where they can't, you, call, you say it's evidence, you say they should be able to go back and get it. How can they get it? You know, how is it all combined? I just... No one is told how they can get their possessions back. And that's a really big thing. You can't just steal people's possessions. So, and Levon exists regardless of Martin. Lorenzo will be followed by Serafin Reyes. Hello. Um, where's the mayor? Because <laughs> actually my comment today is for the mayor because um, the last time I was here, I told you that 168 uh, homeless people died in transit trying to get to the food and the water because of her program from her office, the, 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 the Give Smarter program. Well, since they tried to control the, uh, the donations that people give homeless people directly, food and water, basic necessities. Could um, you pause for a moment? I am sorry. I think we have lost quorum. Maybe someone's in the restroom. Okay, I just, <laughs> it's okay. Oh, perfect. I'm sorry. Please continue. I apologize. Okay. I'm it's cool. trying to follow the open meeting law. Let's go. Cool. Thank you. Please continue. All right, we have to have five of us, but we have. Well, yeah, I'm waiting on the mayor. Have, yep. The, the reason why I'm here today is, is to let you know that I'm a victim of being tortured by the Phoenix Police Department. Because the last time I was here, I told you that I went to the attorney general's office and filed police corruption charges against them. And I haven't heard anything from the attorney general's office. Now, they told me, they said, hey, you know what? After seven days, we don't handle police matters. And then I said, well, well who does? And they said, the FBI. And I said, well, I went and did my history, and it says that you guys work in conjunction with the FBI. So please do your job. And so I left, and I don't hear nothing. Nothing from them. I go over to the, to the city hall today, and I'm being flagged. That means that on the radio, they announced to everybody in the building that Lorenzo Stoutmeyer is in the building. And why? Because I'm trying to get justice. I'm trying to, pr I'm, I'm trying to pursue justice. I'm an American citizen, and I'm homeless. And uh, what I want the mayor to know is, is that I've been trying for two years, even while the Stanton, Greg Stanton was in office, to get in there to talk to the mayor who stands uh, with the people who says, my door is always open. 
before I can even get in the building, I'm being flagged. So uh, I think other people probably being flagged too, but they didn't notice. I just noticed today. So it, it, the same way this whole council just got accused of, uh, of, 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 of illegal zoning, you know, um, we're gonna investigate that. We're not gonna let that go. Another thing, every time you guys okay, that it's okay for somebody to do construction here, did you know that they break ground and that rats come up because you guys disturb the, the, the construction people disturb the ground the nest of the rats homeless people live on the ground so in the area over there by the library by by uh, margaret t hansen park several people have been bit by scorpions spiders and bugs in general and just recently we saw rats so every time you guys okay somebody to do uh construction work um they're breaking ground they're disturbing nests and these bugs are being, rele are being released all over the city and homeless people are being attacked. So I want you to think about that. Because when the ambulance people come out, you know what they do, they take their vitals. As long as their vitals are stable, they leave them there. Even if they say, I insist, I wanna go to the hospital, they leave them there. Proof, 911 calls. All you have to do is pull the calls and listen to them. Again, 168 homeless people died in transit to go and get basic necessities that the people of Phoenix were bringing to them, to their doorstep. Proof, look at the, the amount of people that's being arrested. Look at where they're being arrested and what they're being arrested for. For Thank sleeping you for your testimony. on the ground, not robbing and killing people. Now I'm in the process right now Sarah of Finn filing Reyes will lawsuits. Be followed by Jim Abraham. I'm being interrupted again, thank you. I, where's the mayor? Why does she always run when somebody's serious about human life? Right now, today, we had a count of 172 homeless people who died in transit to go and get food because of a program called Thank you for your testimony. Is, is Seraphin here? We appreciate your testimony. I can, can we, can this we is for city, public comment. Can we have the city attorney, can we have the city attorney explain open, Call the cub. Please, can we have our Mayor, attorney? members of the council, just to clarify, the open meeting law prohibits the elected officials from responding to an individual during public comment because it was not put on the agenda. Okay. Is Jim Abraham here? Thank you for your testimony. My name is Jim Abraham. I own the property at 1020 North 5th Street, District 8. I've had a problem with a temporary fence for over four years. My, my complaint started with neighborhood enforcement for District 8. Nice fellow named Joe. He agreed that it was out of compliance. It was causing problems. People were breaking their tires on the steel girders. He would follow up on it. He did tell me that the owner was out of the country. As soon as he got a hold of him, he'd call me back. That's been two years. I eventually contacted Councilman Garcia's chief of staff, nice lady. She saw the pictures, said she'd follow up on it, and that again took two more calls to her office, never called me back. That led me to come into the council today. I have pictures to show you, but I don't know what to do. I just want to get the, the fence removed. It's an eyesore and it's, it's causing flat tires. If you want to see the pictures, you'd agree with me. Thank you. Our uh, planning director is here and is available to speak with you. Thank you. Uh, Noel Rosen will be followed by Marcy Lynn.
Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. My name is Noel Rosen. I'm not just here as a citizen, I'm here to represent Rally for Law Enforcement. And I wanna talk about the unjust firing of two Phoenix police officers, Detective Swick and Officer Meyer. Now, these, in, the, in one of the cases, one of them was fired because they dared to exercise their right to free speech. The First Amendment does not stop because they put on a badge. That's, that's number one. Um, I wanna thank uh, you, uh, Vice Mayor Waring. I'm sorry I never really got a chance to connect with you. I know you called me. I was, Anna and I called you back and you must have gotten busy, but I just wanna thank you for at least acknowledging the call and, and calling me back. Um, it's really disturbing to see what's happening to the Phoenix Police Department. And I really feel that Chief Williams, I don't even see her here, that she can't even be here to hear what a citizen has to say. She needs to be fired for, for what she is doing to that department. We also need to, to have fired the city manager. You hired her, you need to fire her. And we're being, I've been seeing this over and over and over again, this attack on police. Sal, I've seen your posts. We don't always agree, but I know that we've, we've stood, I think, together on this issue. I also believe, Mayor Gallego, you need to step down from your position. It's pretty obvious where you stood on this whole thing. You'll listen to the opposition on the left, but you'll never listen to us. And Councilman Garcia, if you want to go to the border and pay attention to the illegal immigration issue there, and you want to sit up there with t-shirts that say F the police, I'm not going to say the whole word, then you need to step down, go back to Puente, okay? That's where you came from, okay? You are misusing your position of power to protest. And you're doing the same thing, Mayor Gallego, and it's disgusting and it's despicable, and our officers deserve to have people watching their backs. I am really tired of this attack on our police. I'm tired of this attack on the police by the left, and now we've got a school resource officer that now has to worry about their job because they did the right thing into protecting themselves and others. This has got to stop. This attack on our law enforcement has to stop. It needs to end now. Thank you. Marcy Lynn. Hi, my name is Marcy Lynn, and I actually live in downtown Phoenix, so um, I want to uh, voice my opinion. Um, first off, I, I am pro-law enforcement, um, and I disagree with the Police Oversight Committee um, because they are already vetted and they already have people that can, you know, their own that can oversight them. And people, you know, you're having civilians that have no idea, they don't know anything about you know, um, law enforcement. But one of the things is that um, we need more law enforcement in Phoenix, especially downtown Phoenix, where I live. Um, my phone, I mean, I'm wearing my, I went to the barbecue yesterday and bought the shirt and everything from Plea. And we just don't have enough. I used to live in Scottsdale and, I, and we had police in every corner. And, you know, there are so many homeless people. The people before were talking about casts. Two to 300 people are being turned away at homeless shelters. We don't have homeless shelters. We don't have affordable housing. And then one of the problems is they are now, not all of them, some of them are great, but some of them are, are violent and they're on, and on drugs or they're not on their medication. And I can't even walk my dog. I got attacked the other day. And I have friends that are law enforcement, and I tried to call 911 from somebody else's phone because somebody grabbed my phone while I was walking my, my little dog, and, you know, the screen broke, and I grabbed it back, and, and it's like, I can't even leave where I live, and I live in a really nice, you know, neighborhood. 
um, on Roosevelt, and you know, I can't even because we don't have enough. So I really, really would like more, you know, officers hired and more drug enforcement officers hired, because I mean, it's ridiculous. There's syringes in playgrounds. I mean, there's syringes everywhere. There's drugs everywhere, and I don't think that we would have that if we had more officers. So that's it. Thank you. I saw. Thank you. That conclude concludes today's meeting. We are adjourned.